So Jamie pointed out <laughs> this this uh, a congressman. Is that who it is? Yeah. The, Jamie pointed this out that there's a congressman and he released a series of tweets and the first letter of all these tweets if you put them all together it says Epstein didn't kill himself or did not kill himself is that what it is? Didn't, yeah, I think it's didn't he did uh, I'll pull it up. <laughs> yeah, how do you do the <laughs> apostrophe? Yeah, you can't. So he like, should have gone with did not starting here with that evidence of a link in Rep the Paul e. Gosser what are the odds that this guy did this accidentally? Really small, right? Yeah, that's kind of like one of those monkeys typing Shakespeare things. Yeah, yeah I don't think it could, uh, it could work. And the thing is, he did it backwards, right? So right, you see. didn't see what the puzzle was until the last tweet. Because Who the last that? tweet is an E. I got a tweet from someone about 35 minutes ago that I don't know if there's a bunch of people online paying attention to it or what, but... Someone alerted me and a few other people of it. What is he? Does he have an image of that fucking that crazy mask? Is that in his shit too? Okay, he's yeah, a that weirdo. Might be the H of. He's the, got the. Not until I was November first. So <laughs> the V I, mask. Yes. Yeah. What, what is that mask again? What v is that for vendetta. What was yeah. it yeah. representative of? Was something. It's the guy Fox mask. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So this guy is. Uh, he's he's thinking along alternative lines of thought, but that is really uh, an interesting way of saying it. Alphabet tree, that's called. Yeah, just making a bunch of tweets. Don't ever address it. Just leave it there. Walk just leave away. It there. Yeah, Lewis Carroll was famous for that. Was he? Yeah, that was one of. Uh, he, he, did, he did a lot of sort of tricks with words. Um, did you read the book Gödel Escher Bach? No. Yeah, there's there's a whole whole bunch of stuff in there about people who used um, who put puzzles in text. Mm. You know, it's kind of a thing that that people did, I guess, back more in the 18th century and before. Well, yeah. this Epstein case is probably the most blatant example of a public murder of of a crucial witness I've ever seen in my entire life, or anybody's ever seen, and the 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 minimal amount of outrage. About this, the minimal, oh. minimal amount of cover. It's fucking fascinating. I, I mean, I, what's amazing to me, just as a you know somebody who works in the media, is that this was shaping up to be the biggest like news story in history. Yes. And the instant he you know he died uh, or was died or however you want to call it, yeah. um, it, the story just fell off the face of the earth. Yes. It just, it's like nobody's doing anything about it, and I. I don't a hundred percent understand that. I mean, I I get it why why that's happening, but it's uh it, it's just amazing. Just well, when the woman from ABC, what was her name? Amy. Amy uh -huh, that lady, the the one who Robach. Robach, Robach yeah. Who had the frustrated moment that she called it a pr frustrating private moment. Right. When she was talking about having the scoop and having that story and them squashing it. Right. Like this, this is all stuff that everybody used to think was conspiracy. Every everybody used to think this was stoner talk. This was, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like this is stuff where people are just delusional. They believe all kinds of wacky conspiracies. Sure, but the, the reality is much less complicated. Well, this is not possible. This is one of those things that's so obvious. It's so in everyone's face. Well, there's a couple of things going on because there, there are many different ways this can play out. I mean, you could have a news director who just sort of instinctively decides, well, we can't do that story because I might want to have Will and Kate on later or mm. I might want to have this politician on later. And it's, it's not like anybody tells them necessarily that we can't do this. But they just they, decide it's too hot. You, if you grow up in this system and you've been in the, the business for a long time, you, you just – you have all these things that are drilled into you at almost like the cellular level about mm. what you can and cannot get into. And um, I think, there, but there were some exp explicit things that happened with Epstein too. I mean, they, there, there were a lot of news agencies that killed stories about him that, you know, and we're hearing about some of them, Vanity Fair, this thing, you know. So, yeah, it's, 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 t it's bad. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. When, when I found out that Clinton flew no less than 26 times on a plane with Epstein, I was like, dude, I haven't flown that many times with my mom. <laughs> and how right. long did he know Epstein? Yeah, I, I don't know. But, I mean, to have that many flights, to have the Secret Service uh, people involved, I mean, that's incredibly bold. Uh, now, what was he doing? Was just girls? Was, is, is, is Clinton that much of a hound? That he would go that deep into the well that many times, 26 times? Well, that's the thing about the Epstein story that makes no sense to me. Like, I, I thought that the percentage of people who were out and out, like, perverts who had a, a serious problem, like with pedophilia or whatever, it was, was pretty small, you know? Yeah. But, you're, but 
they had a lot of people coming in and out of this compound and and it just seems like it's a um, it's a very strange story. What were they really up to? I have I have no idea. And was was it all a blackmail scheme? It's just it's just so strange. Well, it seems like the pedophilia aspect of it might be directly connected to Epstein himself. Like he mm-hmm. might be the one that has a problem with girls that are like sixteen, and he likes them very young, or mm-hmm. he did like them. But with the other guys, it could just be girls. It could be, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's why it's so crazy. Like how could it be that these but maybe it's not. But they must. But they knew who he was. Yeah, but they probably didn't know the extent of it. Probably not. Yeah, uh, up until a point. Up until he was arrested. Right. And then they're like, oh, well, then then that's when everybody backed off of him, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I haven't covered this story in depth. I've only I only really got into it a little bit. We when- need you. We need you on this one. You're yeah. the guy. <laughs> this is a tough one. I mean, yeah. you know, because it mixes a lot of things that are are very tough to cover. Yes. You know, the intelligence world is very tough to cover. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's hard to get stories out of there that they don't want you to have. Yeah. And this is this is like the mother of all stories. And you know, in, ter- in terms of that, and they're just little little breadcrumbs here and there. That whole thing about Acosta, you know, the vanity um, vanity fair quote from him is that when he said that when he looked at the case, that he didn't do it because I was told he belonged to intelligence. Yes. What does that mean? Right. You know, who's intelligence? You know what I mean? Right. Like, what agency? Well, what for? You right. know? And then you, you pair that with things like, you know, I, I have friends on Wall Street who tell me, I've never heard a, a single instance of this guy actually having a trade. Right. You know, so what was his hedge fund doing? You know, I mean, if you think about it, a hedge fund's a perfect way to do blackmail, you right. know, because... You can just have people putting money in and out all the time, and it would look like investment. Yeah. You know? So, very strange story. Well, very Eric strange. Weinstein had a conversation with him. You know, Eric Weinstein mm-hmm. who's with Peter Thiel Capital. Right. Yeah. He, he's like, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Oh yeah. He's like, he's financially. A fake. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah. he's an actor. Right. Like, this is nonsense. Right. Right. A that was his in. initial, almost instantaneous response. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 what real clients did he ever have? What yeah. did he What did he trade in? What What? How's he got a billion dollars or whatever he had? Yeah. No. Half it's, a, it's half a billion under management. Yeah, yeah. That's ridiculous. Why did the guy who owns Victoria's Secrets give him a seventy million dollar home? Right. In New York City. Like what? I mean, these are all things that would have been really interesting to get into, you know. If he didn't, uh, uh, if he didn't uh, try he, to kill himself, if twice. the suicide didn't happen to him, like in the wire. Poor right? fella. Yeah, yeah. It's just Crazy. so unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so unfortunate that the cameras died. Uh, so unfortunately, he sustained an injury that's uh, that you usually only get through strangulation. Right. Yeah. Someone murders you. He fell on the ground and accidentally broke his hyoid bone. Yeah. It happens all the time. Whatever. Right? Yeah. No big deal. <laughs> I mean, it's so bizarre. I'm, I I can't stand cons- conspiracy theories. I'm one of these people who who doesn't like reading, but I, I can't I can't make the story work in a way that isn't you know conspiratorial. Yeah. In some well, way. that's the thing. It's like it gets to a point where you're like, okay. Even Michael Shermer, who runs Skeptic Magazine, was mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, the cameras were not working? Yeah. I mean, it's like, such okay, a bad well, this, excuse. This seems like a conspiracy. Fucking when Michael Shermer says, right. seems, he, that guy doesn't believe in anything. Right. I right. mean, he is fucking, he's down the line on virtually every single thing that's ever happened. He doesn't believe in any conspiracies. Well, well, how do you, what's the innocent explanation for any of this? none. It doesn't yeah, make you, any you, sense. You can't, you can't spin it in any way to make it not a, re, a crazy conspiracy. Especially theory. when the, the brother hires a doctor to do an autopsy. And oh, the yeah. The doctor says, like, Baden. this guy was fucking murdered. Right. Yeah, Michael Baden, the, the famous guy from the HBO autopsy show. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, craziness. Complete craziness. And, you know, it's, it's an example of, of, um, you know, the Epstein story is interesting because it's because it's about villains on both sides of the aisle, right? Yeah. This is a classic. This is something I've written about before: is that the press does not like to do stories where the problem is bipartisan. Yeah. Right. So when you have an institutional problem, when Democrats and Republicans both share responsibility for it, when you know, or or if it's an institution that kind of exists in perpetuity, no matter what the administration is, we don't really like to do those stories. We like if. Fox likes to do stories about Democrats. MSNBC likes to do stories about Republicans. But the the thing that's kind of you know all over the place, they don't like to do that story. Epstein is you know he's he's friends with Trump and and with Clinton. I mean, yeah. it looks like he has more friends on the Clinton side, but still. And I think that's this is one of the reasons why this story 
doesn't have a lot of traction in the media because neither side really likes the idea of going too deeply on it. Right. Feels like to me. Well, it's but the 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 blatant aspect of it. The only I mean the closest that we have to that is an absolute murder, the Jamal Khashoggi mm-hmm. murder. That's the closest thing we have to where it's absolute murder. Right. This one, but but it's also so insanely blatant, but now you have foreign actors that are involved in it, and they all disperse, and then there's left with this confusion of to who's responsible for it. Well, Saudi Arabia, that's another example where you can't really say it's – you know, one side of the both parties have been incredibly complicit in their cooperation with yeah. the Saudi regime and in you know the massacres that are going on in Yemen. Um, it's a classic example of what Noam Chomsky used to talk about with worthy and unworthy victims, right? Mm-hmm. Like if the if the Soviet communists did it, they were that was bad. But if death squads in El Salvador killed a priest or a Catholic priest, you know, then that that was something we didn't write about because they were our client state. Yemen is a story we don't write about Syria, is a story we do write about, but they're really equivalent stories. And, um, you know, but you're absolutely right. The Khashoggi thing, I I don't think either party or either side's media really wants to get into that all that deeply. How much is media shifting now? Like, you've you've obviously been a journalist for a long time. How how much are things changing in the light of the internet? Well, a lot. And this is why, I mean, I have a new book out now that's really about this, right? The, what, why the, the business has changed. What's it called? Hate Inc. Yeah, it's out, it's out now. And uh, it's, it's really about how the press, the business model of the press has changed. I mean, you, it's something that you talk about a lot. You, I, I hear you on your show all, all the time talking about how um, news agencies are always trying to push narratives on people, trying to get people wound up and upset. Uh, and... That is a conscious business strategy that we didn't have maybe 30 years ago. You know, you think about Walter Cronkite or what the news was like back in the day. You had the whole family sitting around the table and everybody watching. It was sort of a unifying experience to watch the news. Hmm. Now you have news for the crazy right-wing uncle and then you have news for the, the kid <laughs> in the Shea t-shirt. And yeah. they're different channels and they're trying to wind these, these people up, uh, you know, to get them upset constantly and stay there. And a lot of that has to do with the internet because um, before the internet, news companies had like a basically free way of, to ma- of making money. They dominated distribution. The newspaper was the only thing in town that had a, you know, if you wanted to get a WAN ad, it had to be through the local newspaper. Now with the internet, the internet is the distribution system. Anybody has access to it, not just the local newspaper. And so there, the easy money is gone, and we have to chase clicks more than we ever had uh, had to before. We have to chase eyeballs more than we had to. So we've had to build new money-making strategies, and, and a lot of it has to do with just sort of monetizing anger and division and all these things. And we just didn't do that before, and it's, it had a profound difference on, on, the, on, on the media. As a writer, have you personally experienced this sort of uh, the influence where people have tried to lean you in the direction of clickbait or perhaps maybe alter titles that – make them a little bit disingenuous in order to get people excited about the story? I mean, you know, I, I, my editors at Rolling Stone are, are, are pretty good, and they, and they give me a lot of wee- leeway to kind of explore whatever I want to explore. But I, I definitely feel a lot of pressure that I didn't feel before in the business because, especially in the Trump era, and, and you know, I've written a lot about the Russia story, right? But, you know, that's an example of one side's media does has one take on it and another side's media has another take on it and if you are just a journalist and you and you want to just sort of report the facts you feel a lot of pressure to fit the facts into a narrative that your audience is going to like mm. and i had a lot of problem with the russia story because i i thought you know i don't like donald trump but i'm like i, I don't i don't think this guy's james bond consorting with russian spies i think he's corrupt in other ways and there was a lot of blowback on my side of the business um, because, you know, people in sort of liberal, quote unquote, liberal media, you, you just have, a, there's a lot of pressure to have everybody fit into a certain narrative. And I think that's mm. really unhealthy for the business. Yeah, very unhealthy, right? Because as soon as people can be manipulated to conforming to that narrative, then all sorts of stories can be shifted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, the the job used to be about challenging your audience every now and then, right? Like if you think a certain thing is true, well, it's our job to give you the bad news and say that you're wrong about that. That used to be what the job was to be be a journalist. Now it's the opposite. Now 
we have an audience. We're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear and what you, and we're going to reinforce what you think. And that's very unhealthy. I mean, a, a, a great example of this was in the summer of 2016, um, I was covering the campaign. I started to hear um, reporters talking about how they didn't want to report poll numbers that showed the race was close. They thought that that was going to hurt Hillary, mm. right? Like, so in other words, we had information that the race was close. And we're not telling this to audiences because they wanted to hear that it was going to be a blowout for Hillary, right? Mm. Um, and that didn't help Hillary. It didn't help the Democrats to no. not warn people about this, right? Um, but it was just because if you turned on MSNBC or, or CNN and you heard that Trump was within five points or whatever it was, that was going to be a bummer for that audience. So we stayed away from it. And, you know... So, this is the kind of thing that it's it's not politically beneficial to anybody. It's just we're just trying to keep people glued to the set by telling them what they want to hear, and that's not the news. That's not the, that's not our job, you know. Uh, and it, it it drives me crazy. Yeah, it should drive you crazy. That what you said about journalism being it used to be something that you're challenging your reader. You're you're giving them this reality that may be uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. it's it's educational and expands their view of the world. This. Where, where do they get that now? They don't. That's the whole problem. Like, you get, you can predict exactly what the, each news organization, what their take is going to be on any issue by going, I'll, I'll, just to take an example, when, um, when the business about the ISIS leader, al-Baghdadi, being killed, um, hit the news, Instantaneously, you knew that the New York Times, CNN, the Washington Post, that they were going to write a whole bunch of stories about how Trump was overplaying the significance of it, that he, you know, um, that he was telling lies about it. They were, they made, they, you knew they were going to make the entire thing about Trump. Uh, and then meanwhile, Fox had a completely different spin on it about how hero heroic it was. But, but news audiences didn't have anywhere to go to, to just simply hear who was this person, why was he important? What were the right. what do the people in the region think? You know, what kind of what is this going to mean going forward? Is it actually going to have any impact? You know, is are we going to have to continually? Um, you know, is there going to be a new person like this every every time? Right? Are we actually accomplishing it? Like, you don't get that anywhere. All you get is Trump is a shithead on one side and and Trump is a hero on the other side, yeah. and that's that's not the news. You no. Know? Yeah. And but the thing is, it's like. The business aspect of it is so weird. Like you, you have your guys like Hannity, where you can absolutely predict what that guy's going to say every single time. You know what side he's on, and he's blatant about it. Mm -hmm. And when you see someone like that, you go, "Okay, well, this is okay. We're, this is this is peak bullshit, right?" So where where do we go? Where I see both sides. Where's the where's the where's the middle ground where someone goes, "Well, this is true, but you got to say this is honest too, and this is this is what's going on over on this side." And the Republicans have a point here, and you don't you don't. There's no mainstream media place where you can go for that right now no there isn't and that's i mean i mean one of this is one of the things i write about this is one of the reasons why shows like yours are so popular i mean i i, I think there's a complete loss of trust that they feel like people are not being honest with them right and they're not being straight and you know they they come to people like you and and a lot of other people in, in, uh, sort of independent folks who aren't like the quote-unquote mainstream media um because they it's not really thought. It's not reporting. It's not anything. If you can predict a hundred percent what a person is going right. to say, that's not thinking. That's not reporting. That's not. It's just marketing. But for someone know? like me, that's so disturbing. I'm a fucking comedian and a cage fighting commentator. <laughs> when people are coming to me, like this is this is the source where you go for unbiased representations of what's going on in the world. That's crazy. Well, I mean, this is. I mean, I saw your interview with Barry Weiss, right? And you just you did a simple base. You didn't go to journalism school, right? No, no. So she said something about how, um, you know, oh, she's an Assad toady. And you said, what does that mean? You just asked the simple, basic questions, right? Yeah. What does that mean? Where, where is that coming from? How do you know that? You know, yeah. like journalism is in brain surgery. That's all it is. It's just right. asking the, the simple questions that sort of pop to mind when you when you're in a situation like where did this happen? How do we know that? How do we know that's true? And but there's a whole generation of people in the press now who just simply do not 
do that. Go through the process of just asking simple questions. Like, how do I know that's true? Like after each story you report, you're supposed to kind of like wipe your memory clean and start over. Mm -hmm. So just because somebody was banned the last time you covered them doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to be the bad guy this time you cover them, right, right? right? You have to continually test your assumptions and ask yourself, is this true? Is that true? Is this true? How do we know this? And we've just stopped doing that. Like the, the it's just a morass of, of like pre-written takes on things, and it's it's really really bad. Uh, and you can see why audiences are, are are fleeing from this stuff. They they just don't have the impact they used to. Well, it's really interesting. That this a lot of this is this unpredicted consequence of having these open platforms like Facebook and like where where people are getting their news, and then the algorithm sort of d d directs them towards things that are going to piss them off. Which I don't even think necessarily was initially the plan. I think the plan is to accelerate engagement, right? So mm -hmm. they find out what 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 you're engaging with, what stories you're engaging with, and then they give you more of that. Like Ari, my friend Ari Shafir, actually p tried this out. And the, what he did was he went on YouTube and only looked up puppy videos. <laughs> and that's all he looked at for like weeks. Uh -huh. And then YouTube only started recommending puppy videos to him. So it's not necessarily that Facebook wants you to be outraged, but that when you are outraged, whether it's over abortion or war or whatever the subject is, you're going to engage more and their algorithm favors you engaging more. Mm -hmm. So if you're engaging more about something very positive, you know, if you're all about yoga and meditation, your algorithm would probably favor yoga and meditation because those are the things that you engage with. But it's natural for people. To be pissed off sure. and to look for things that are annoying, especially if you're done working and you're like, God, this world sucks. What's going on that sucks worse? And then you go to your Facebook and, oh, Jesus, look at this goddamn border crisis. Right. Oh, Jesus, look at this. Well, fucking, here's the problem with these goddamn liberal. They don't know shit. And you, you, you engage and then that's your life. And then it's it's saying, oh, I know how to get Matt all fired up. I'm going to fucking send him some abortion stories. Woo. Right. And then that's your feed. Right. Yeah, exactly. But the, the but there's so many economic incentives that go in there, yeah. right? They know that the, the more that you engage, the longer that you're on, right. the more ads yes. that you can, you're going to see, yes. right? So that same dynamic that Facebook and, and the social media companies figured out, which yeah. is that if you keep feeding something, somebody something that you know, has been proven to spin that person up and get them wound up, that they're going to they're gonna come back for more of it and they're going to keep coming back. And actually, you can expand their desire to, to see that stuff by, mm -hmm. by making them sort of more angry overall and they will, they will come back and they will spend more and more and more time. Well, the news companies figured out the same thing and they're just, they're just funneling stuff at you that they know you're going to you're you're going to just be in an endless cycle of sort of impotent mute rage all the time mm -hmm. but it's kind of addicting you know yes. and they know that and they, and they and it's it's sort of like the tobacco companies they they know it's a bad, it's a product that's bad for you and they just keep giving it to you because you know it makes money for them yeah and it's just the thing about it is all of it is about ads Totally. And how many clicks they get in ads. If they just said, you can have a social media company, but you can't have ads. There's a new federal law, no more ads on Facebook, no more ads on YouTube, no more ads on Twitter, no more ads on Instagram. Good luck. Right. Yeah. Like it those would be businesses totally were all collapse. Yep. Yeah. But that seems to be what it is. It's like they figured out that your data is worth a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. And the way they can utilize that money is to sell advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they they get it coming and going because yes. they're they're not only selling you ads or or but they're also collecting the information about yes. your habits, which they can then sell, sell again. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a dual revenue stream. You know, the the media companies, they're basically they're just consumer businesses where they're they're trading attention for ad space, right? So if they can get you to to watch four hours of television a day, they have that many ad slots that they can show you, and they know how much money they're going to make. You know. But the, the the social media companies get it two ways. They're, they they get it by, you know, attracting your eyeballs and then also selling selling your habits to the other the next set of advertisers, which, you know, is very insidious. But what's interesting about this is that most people don't think about this as a consumer business, right? Like Americans these days are very conscious of like what they put in their bodies. You know, they won't eat too many candy. Well, depending on who they are, right? But people at least look at what the calories are, but they don't think about the news that way or social media, what, that, what they put right. in their brains. And it's also a consumer product. Yeah, it really is. I've, I've 
gone over that many times with people that that's a diet. This is your diet. You have a mental diet as well as you have a physical like food diet. Absolutely. You have an information diet. And a lot of people are just eating shit it's, with their brain. It's the worst kind of junk food. <laughs> it's like it's like a cigarette sandwich, the stuff yeah. that we eat. Yeah, it's so fucking bad. It's, and it's getting worse. It is. It is getting worse. And it's what's weird is that this is a 10-year-old problem and no one saw it coming. And it's kind of overtaken politics. It's overtaking uh, social discourse. Everybody's wrapped up in social media conversations. They carry them on over to the dinner table, and it, it gets people in arguments at work, and all this stuff no one saw coming. These that no one saw the this outrage economy from you know social media sites, from things like Facebook. No one saw that. No one no one ever predicted that your data was going to be so valuable. No, like, who the fuck I, saw that? I don't think anybody. F- I mean, I think some people in the tech business probably saw early on the, poten- yes. the pe- potential for this. But, you know, in terms of other other businesses like the news media and also politics, I mean, you have to think about the impact of this on politics. It's been enormous. I mean, you know, I covered Donald Trump. Trump really was just all about whatever you're pissed off about, I'm right there with you, you know? Mm. And people are just sort of pissed off about lots of things these days because they're they're doing this all day long, right. you know? And if you if you can if you can uh, take advantage of that, then you're going to have a lot of success. And I think I think a lot of people haven't figured that out. And some of these things are real causes, like people are upset about real things, um, but it's just I don't know, you're absolutely right. People did not see this coming and they didn't prepare for it. It's just weird that it's one of the biggest sources of income online and people didn't see it coming. I mean, Facebook is generating billions of dollars and now oh, yeah. potentially shifting global politics. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of, of a couple of companies like Facebook having control over what you do and do not see is, yes. an, is an enormous problem that yes. nobody nobody really cares about. I've tried to write about it a few times. I've written a couple of features about it and about how what a serious problem this is. Like if you look in other countries like um, Israel, uh, China, there, there are a number of companies where you've seen this, this pattern of internet platforms liaising with the government to decide what people can and cannot see. And they'll they'll say, well, we don't want to see you know Palestinian protest movements, or we don't want to see um, you know the the Venezuelan channel Telesaur. Like we want to take that off. You think about how that could end up happening in the United States, and it is already a little bit happening. It's a little bit, but it seems to be happening only in the terms of like t- leaning towards the progressive side, which people are okay with because mm-hmm. they think, especially in the light of Donald Trump being in office, this is acceptable censorship. Yeah, but they're—I mean, I think they're wrong about that. I think they're wrong about that too. Yeah, yeah and, it's, and, it's and terribly dangerous. It's very short-sighted. Yes, and and they and, and I think there's there's also this thing that happens with um, people where they think, oh, this is never going to happen to me. You know, like uh, you can do that bad thing to this person that I don't like, but you know, right. as long as it's never going to happen to me, exactly. But they're wrong. I mean, history shows it always does happen to you. You know, and right. that's so we're we're giving these companies an enormous amount of power to decide. All kinds of things. What we what we look at, um, what what kind of political ideas we can be exposed to. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's very very dangerous. That biased interpretation of what something is. That was what people talked about when the initial Patriot Act was enacted. When people were like, "Hey, this might be fine with Obama in office." Right. It, oh, maybe Obama is not going to enact some of the worst clauses of this and use it on people, or the um, was it NDAA? Is that what it right. was? Yeah. Yeah. Where this, some of the things were just completely unconstitutional. But don't worry, we're not going to use those. But you're setting these tools aside for whatever fucking president we have. Like, what if we have a guy who out trumps Trump? Right. I mean, we never thought we'd have a Trump, right? What if we have a next level guy post Trump? What if there's some sort of catastrophe tragedy attack something that really gets people fired up and they vote in someone who takes it up to another level and then he has these tools and then he uses these tools on his political enemies which is entirely possible well i mean we've already seen that a little bit i mean people don't want to bring this up i mean but you know a lot of the stories that have come out about trump they're coming from leaks of classified information that are coming from those war on terror programs that were instituted after 9-11. Yes. The, the, the sort of FISA Amendments Act, the NSA programs to collect data, like they're they're unmasking people. Like they, we have a lot of evidence now that there was a lawsuit a couple that came out about a month ago that showed 
that the FBI was doing something like 60,000 searches a month at one point where they were, on, you know, they were asking the NSA for the ability to unmask names and that, that sort of thing. So we're, I mean, these tools are incredibly powerful. They're incredibly dangerous. But people thought after 9-11, they were scared. So, you know, we want to yeah. protect ourselves. So that's okay for now. You know, uh, we'll, we'll pull it back later. But, they ne- but you never do pull it back. Right. You know what never. I mean? It, it always ends up being used by somebody in the wrong way. And I think we're starting to see that that's going to be a problem. Yeah, I'm real concerned about p- places like Google and Facebook altering the path of, of free speech and and leaning people in certain directions and silencing people that have opposing viewpoints and the fact that they think that they're doing this for good because this is how they see the world and they don't understand that you have to let these ideas play out in the marketplace of free speech and free ideas if you don't do that if you don't do that, if you don't let people debate the merits, the pros, the cons, what's wrong, what's right, if you don't do that, then you don't get real discourse. If you don't get real discourse, you're essentially, you've got some sort of an intellectual dictatorship going on. And because it's a progressive dictatorship, you think it's okay. Because it's people who want everybody to be inclusive and, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. this is this is a weird time for that. It's a really weird time for that because, as you said, people are so short-sighted. They don't understand that these, like... The First Amendment's in place for a very good reason. It's set up a long fucking time ago because they did the math. They saw where it was going, and they were like, look, we have to have the ability to express ourselves. We have to have the ability to freely express thoughts and ideas and challenge people that are in a position of power because if we don't, we wind up exactly where we came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and courts continually reaffirmed that idea that the 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 way to deal with bad speech was with more speech. Yes. And they did it over and over and over again. You know, we, we, the, the legal standard for speech, you know, still I think remains that unless it's directly inciting violence, you can, you like, you can have speech that incites violence generally. And even in the the Supreme court even upheld that you can have speech that's, that comes from, you know, material that was stolen illegally. That's okay. Um, but we had a very, very high bar for prohibiting speech always. And, you know, the, the libel cases, the, the cases for defamation, um, you know, that also established a very, very high standard for punishing speech. But now all of a sudden people have a completely different idea about it. It's like, you know, forget about the fact that this was a fundamental concept in American society for, you know, 230 years or whatever, but they just want to change it, I, yeah. you know, without thinking about the consequences. Well, that's where a guy like Trump could be almost like, it's like almost like a Trojan horse in a way. Like if you wanted to play 3D chess, what you would do, you'd get a guy who's just so egregious and so outrageous. And then so many people oppose him. Get that guy, let him get into a position of power, and then sit back, watch the outrage bubble, and then take advantage of that and funnel people into certain directions. I mean, I don't think that's what's happening. But if I was super fucking tinfoil hatty, that's how I would go about it. I would say, this is what you want. If you really want to change things for your direction, put someone that opposes it, that's disgusting. And that way, people just a, a rational, intelligent person is never going to side with him. So right. they're going to side with the people that oppose him, and then you could sneak a lot of shit in that maybe they wouldn't agree with in any other circumstance. Yeah, Trump's election is sort of like another nine eleven, right? Like you know, nine eleven happened. All of a sudden, people who weren't in favor of the government being able to go through your library records or listen to your phone calls, and all of a sudden they were like, "Oh, Jesus, I'm so freaked out." Like, yeah, yeah fine. When Trump got elected, all of a sudden, people suddenly had d- very different ideas about speech, right? Like they, you know, hey, that guy's so bad, um, you know, that maybe we should consider banning X, Y, and Z, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, I, it's, if, <laughs> if he was conceived as, as, a, as a way to discredit uh, the First Amendment it, when, and some other ideas, it, that, would, that would be a, a brilliant 3D chess move. Yeah, sure. super sneaky. Yeah. That's like China level, many <laughs> steps ahead. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, what do you, I mean, where do you think all this goes? It, it seems like this is, I mean, obviously you just wrote a book about it, but it seems like this is accelerating. And it doesn't seem like anyone's taking a step back and hitting the brakes or opting out. It seems like people are just ramping up the rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the divisiveness problem is is going to get worse before it gets better. the The business model of the, of 
of the media now is so entrenched um, that until some of these these companies start going out of business because they're doing, you know, they're they're losing audience because people don't trust them anymore. Um, the you know the news is going to keep doing what it's doing. It's going con- it, to the, the Hannity model is going to become normal for for news companies. I think it are, it already basically is. You know, on both the left and the right. Um, and in terms of you know the internet companies, they're consolidating. They're getting more and more power all the time. And there's I, I think we've already seen that people have I think too much tolerance for letting letting them make decisions about what we can and cannot see and. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I don't know. What do you think? I, I That's what I think. I mean, fa- Facebook, Twitter, all these places. I mean, Twitter has some of the most ridiculous reasons for banning people. One of them is dead naming. Oh, yeah. So I if know. you call Caitlyn Jenner Bruce, right. like, hey, I like you better when you were Bruce. Banned for life. Right. You can't even say, I like you better when you were Bruce. Banned for life. Right. Yeah. And 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 actually, that that what's really interesting about that is that's a that's a – core concept that we've changed completely like all the different ways in the past that we punish speech we punish the speech not the person yes right so if you know libel defamation all those things first of all they were all done through the courts so you you had a way to fight back if you thought you were unjustly accused of having defamed somebody or libeled somebody but if they found against you the per- the person who got something out of it was the person who was directly harmed right and the, and the courts judge that and they, you know, it wasn't like you were banned from for life from ever speaking again. Right. They just gave a bunch of money to a person who might have suffered some kind of career injury or whatever it was because of that. Um, and uh, usually there was a retraction or it was removed from the press or whatever it was. But it wasn't like we were t- we were saying we're never going to allow you to be heard or seen from again. We kind of won't. We were sort of encouraging optimistically people to get better right yes, and, to, yes. and to be different right. you know and now we're not doing that at all now we're just saying you know one one strike or two strikes whatever you're gone and it's not like it's a public thing so you can't sue over it you know right yeah well that's what's crazy about it because it is a public utility in a, in a way yes it is it and should be. even jack dorsey from twitter mm-hmm. admitted as much on the podcast and he wishes that we would view it that way he's actually proposed two versions of twitter a, a, a Twitter with their standard censorship in place, and then a Wild West Twitter. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, sign me up. Right? How yeah, do exactly. I get on that Wild West Twitter? Right. Because the problem with like things like Gab, and I've gone there a few times and watched it, and I mean, even Milo Yiannopoulos has criticized it for being this, is that it's just like so hate filled because it's the place where you can go and fucking say anything. Right. So the only people that it's attracting are people that just want to go there and just fucking shoot off cannons of n bombs and right. call everybody a kike. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's and there's real communication there as well. There's there's plenty of that too, but the 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 sheer number of people that go there just to blow off steam because they can't say those things on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media platform without being banned. Because of that, it, it becomes a channel for it, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like it doesn't get a chance. It got, doesn't get a chance to. The, the concept is great. The concept is. If you're not doing anything illegal, we're not going to stop you. You're not doxing anybody. You're not threatening anybody's life. We're not going to stop you. Go ahead. But if you you do that and you're the only one that does that, unfortunately, everyone who wants to just say fucked up shit just right. goes right. And you get a disproportionate amount of fucked up shit. Yeah. And it's directly because of the fact that these places like Twitter or Facebook have censored and they, they make it so you are scared to say whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. And so you can't. So even if you have controversial ideas that maybe some people would agree with and some won't, you can get banned for life for just controversial ideas. Even controversial ideas that are scientifically and biologically factual, like right. the transgender issue. Like if you say, there's a woman, I brought her up a million times, but Megan Murphy. Murphy, Murphy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A man is never a woman, she says. They tell her to take it down. She takes a screenshot of it, puts that up. Takes it down, but takes a screenshot of the initial tweet. Mm-hmm. Says, ha ha, look at that. Banned for life. Right. A man is never a woman is a fact. That right. is a fact. It's a biological fact. Now, if you decide to become a woman and we recognize you as a woman in society, well, that's just common courtesy in my eyes. Like, you have a person who has this issue. They feel like they were born in the wrong body. Okay, I, I get that. I'm cool with that. But to make it so that you're banned forever... You can call someone a dumb fuck, an idiot, a piece of shit. Your mother should have swallowed you. Everybody's like, yeah, terms of service seem fine here. Everything's good. Say a man is never a woman. Gone for life. 
Right. Yeah. Call and, Caitlyn Jenner. I liked you better when you were Bruce. Done. That's yeah, it. Yeah. No. And and it's crazy. And obviously, pe- people see that and they and they just get madder. And yeah. it, and it seems to legitimate. You know. It, it makes people very, very resentful in ways that they wouldn't be otherwise. And it makes know? there's no pathway. There's no there's no other thing, right? There's no free speech platform that's universally accepted. Like these ones, like I said, like Gab, or there's a couple other ones out there. There's no no one's using them. It's, yeah, it's it's a very small percentage of the people in comparison to something like Twitter, which is enormous. Right, and so because people don't want to le- be kicked off the platform, they're com- they're radically Compliant. changing their yes, behavior. Yes, right? yes, yes. Self censoring, and we're seeing this a lot also with political ideas too. Like you know, you know, I have a podcast, Use- Useful Idiots, it's called. Right, we like we we try to talk to people who are kind of excluded from mainstream media because that's happening a lot now. Right, like if you have the wrong idea about anything whether it's Russiagate or or the Israel Palestine conflict or Syria or wh- whatever it is you'll you will suddenly be sort of labeled I think with Tulsi Gabbard for instance they call her an Assadist right like once you get stuck with the term Assadist on Twitter nobody wants to associate you with you no one wants to defend you right they all kind of and it's you're, you're like suddenly like the kid with lice and people don't want that to happen to them, so they right. they stop saying X, Y, and Z, yes. right? And and they just sort of go with the, with the flow, go with the crowd, and it, it causes this sort of you know uniform uh, conformist uh, discourse that doesn't isn't really about anything, right? Because right. people are just afraid to talk, uh, which is crazy. Yeah, right. Well, you're not supposed to talk to someone. I, I experience this all the time. The, this idea of giving someone a platform, mm-hmm. like you, like if I have someone on like a Ben Shapiro or something like that, you shouldn't give that guy a platform. Well, he's already got a platform. Should wouldn't it be better if I just talk to him and find out what his ideas are and, and and ask him about those ideas? Like we had a very bizarre conversation about gay people, where he, I mean he's basically full on biblical religious t- interpretation of gay people, which to me is always strange. Like okay, how do you stand on shellfish? You know, do you, are you, you just as strong on shrimp <laughs> right, as you yeah. are on gay guys? Right, like, pork. Why, why yeah. is it gay guys? It's that, like, the Bible's pretty clear on a bunch of different things that don't seem to fire people up the way homosexuality does. Like, why? Mm-hmm. Why do you care? If you had a friend that was eating shrimp, would you go to his house if he had shrimp cocktail? No. But you wouldn't go to a friend's house if he was having a gay marriage. Mm-hmm. So you won't celebrate gay marriage, but you don't mind a guy who's got a, a fucking a shellfish platter right. out at a party. Like that's in the Bible, man. Right. You're not supposed to wear two different kinds of cloth. You're, you, you know, there's a, the bunch, there's a bunch of shit in the Bible that you, you're like, well, God was wrong about that. Like, how confident are you? Right. How confident are you that you can interpret God's word? So perfectly that you like you let the lobster slide, but all all that butt fucking we got to stop that. You know, like it's really weird. But that's the whole point is you you, you challenge the idea, yes, right? Yes. yes. But but the, the prevailing view now is that even having the discussion, yes, because you have a platform. I mean, I read that thing in Atlant- the Atlantic, you know, where they're like. You, you you give people to uh, I forget what the phrase was they were saying something like um, you had I give to people too many chances too many chances to people who had already forfeited the right to have them or some, something along those lines right? that guy was silly that yeah. guy gave up his hand when he said about me that I'm inexhaustible but that he likes naps right I go, yeah. oh it's about you and your naps <laughs> that's what it is you not you like naps okay so you don't like people that have energy I'm super sorry but the, the I mean I, I thought that piece was really interesting because that that whole idea that there are people who have forfeited the right to, to communicate forever to communicate forever well who decides that i mean it, again there's this there's this intellectual snobism yes. that goes on in um you know re- frankly on my side of the media aisle where well we'll decide what what an, what a, an appropriate thought is what's what's right thinking what's wrong thinking you know what who gets to have a platform who doesn't get to have a platform who we who we're going to call a monster who we're not going to i mean i just don't understand the the arrogance where where that comes from to decide that some people you know and i totally disagree with people like um you know alex jones or shapiro or or, you know most things and uh but i don't think that they should be wiped off the face of the earth i mean i I don't know 
Well, it's interesting to challenge people on these weird ideas and find out how they come to them. And, and you will get a lot of fence sitters that will recognize the flaws in their thinking if you let them talk. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are unsure either way. Maybe they haven't invested a lot of time investigating it. Maybe they, they really don't know what this guy stands for. Maybe they just read a cartoonish version of who he is. And then you get to hear him talk and you go, oh, well, I see the flaw in his thinking. Or, oh, well, he's right about some things. And a lot of people are right about some things. Sure. They're wrong about things and they're right about things. And the only way you, you can discern that is you communicate with them. But as soon as you de-platform people, like forever, you're just going to make a bunch of angry people. Mm -hmm. You're just going to make a bunch of people that are completely distrusting. And you're going to absolutely empower the opponents of your ideas. But like people that do get to when when do they get a chance to have their voice? Well, when they vote. Right. So the the more you do this shit, and the more you censor conservatives, the more they're going to vote against liberals. This is just a fact. Mm -hmm. There's no getting around that. This is human nature. Yeah, I mean, I I, I lived in the former Soviet Union, um, you know, for eleven years, and one hundred percent. If if you lived in Soviet Russia and something was published by an official publisher. People thought it was basically full of shit, right? But if it was in the Samizdat, if it was in the privately circled stuff that had been repressed and censored, people thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Like that—that that was the hot ticket, right? Mm. And you're automatically giving something uh, cachet and um, an added weight by censoring it. I mean, right. this is just—it's just the way it works. It's human nature. If, if people think that you don't want them to see something, they're going to run to it twice as hard, you know. Right. So I, I just don't understand a lot of that instinct. I think people people have this idea that it works, um, that you know, that deplatforming works, but you can't deplatform an idea. You know, you may be able to do it to a person or two. Yes. But you, eventually you have to confront the idea. You can do it to a few people, and, and it has been successful, which is one of the reasons why people are so emboldened. Like, they have a successfully deplatformed Milo. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really have. It's mm -hmm. very hard to hear him talk anymore. You don't, he's not in the public conversation the way he used to be right. because they kicked him off of all these different platforms. And if you, go into why they kicked him off these different platforms. But even if you don't agree with him, and I don't on a lot of things, like, boy, I don't agree with kicking him off those platforms. If you, you listen to what he got kicked off for, it's like, man, I don't know. This this doesn't seem like this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, I mean, and same thing with Alex Jones. Yeah. I mean, Alex, Alex Jones has, has said, you know, he's, he's gone after me a couple of times in ways that were pretty funny, actually. Um, but when he was, you know, kicked off the all these platforms, you know, I wrote a piece saying I, I think people are kind of doing a, a, an end zone dance a little early on, on this one, you know, because um, you know, Jones is a classic example of how the system, the way the system used to work, they would have punished him for for being you know, libelous about the Sandy Hook thing, right? Because that that was sort of fit the classic definition of what was what prohibited speech was before. But we wouldn't, and he would have lost probably a lot, and he still might in those court cases. Um, but to remove him forever, I think, you know, uh, it just sets, it, it, it creates a new way of dealing with speech that I think is very dangerous. You know? Right, because the goalposts keep getting moved. Right. If you can ban him for that, then wh why don't you ban me for repeating the things that I said about Megan Murphy? Right. Or ban, because what I said about Bruce Jenner, ban this for that. I mean, you, you, it gets, you get further and further down the line, you keep moving these goalposts, and next thing you know, you're in a very rigid, tightly controlled area where you can communicate, and you're suppressed. And that just it, 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 it accelerates your desire to step out of that boundary. And it makes you want to say things that maybe you wouldn't even have thought of before. And also, logistically, it's an incredibly, it's, a, it's a, an insane thing to even think about asking platforms to rationally go through all this content. I talked right. to somebody who was a pretty high-ranking Facebook executive after the Alex Jones thing. And he said, think about what we used to, ha used to do just to keep porn off Facebook. And we're, de we're dealing with, what, a couple of billion items of content every single day. We had these really high-tech algorithms that we designed to look for flesh tones. That, that's how, and that's how the Vietnamese running girl photo got taken off f Facebook because they it, like automatically spotted a naked girl you know, oh, and they, wow. they took that down. Like, you know, the, he's like, the Facebook algo doesn't know that's an icon of fucking journalism, right? right like, it just right. knows it's a naked girl. So, you say, you take that, and now you're going to ask Facebook to make decisions about, about ideas, 
right? Like yeah. if, if, if it's that hard and that expensive for us to go through and just, just to keep child porn off of Facebook, think about how crazy it's going to be when we, when we start having entry-level people deciding what is and, and is not appropriate political content. Yeah. It's, it's not only going to be impossible to enforce, it's, it's gonna, they're going to make a mess of it, and they will, and they already are. You know? And I, and I think that's what we're seeing. Well, that's why Twitter is so weird, because you can get away with shit on Facebook. You can say things on Facebook. Like, Facebook doesn't have a policy about dead naming, or uh, Facebook doesn't have a policy about uh, misgendering people, but they do have a porn policy. Well, now, Twitter, you can have porn. Right. Me, they don't, like, I have to be very careful when I give my phone to my kids. They make sure they don't open up the fucking Twitter app. Yeah. Because I follow a lot of dirty girls. And some of them, <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, they're, it's just right there. There's no warning. Bang. Right in your face. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Right. They, yeah. they have such a, an open policy when it comes to sex, which I'm, I'm happy they do. I'm happy, not even that I want to see porn, but I'm happy that their attitude is just fine. It's legal. Do yeah. it. You yeah. don't have to follow those people if you don't like. It seems like it's in the American spirit to be. Yes. I don't know, but but that's, uh, what, that's what it all comes down to for me. But um, but yeah, no, the, the the policies are completely inconsistent too with with Twitter. Like I've seen, I mean, I've talked to people who've been removed from Twitter for saying pretty, you know, pretty borderline things, right? Like they're yeah. you know basically pretty mild insults or something that would be threatening only if you really squinted hard, you know. And like right. there was a guy from the Ron Paul Institute who got who got taken down, for instance, because he was having a, a fight with some you know guy who was, I think, a Clinton fan. I forget what it was exactly, but y- you'll see behavior that's much worse from people who of another political ilk and they will not be removed uh, or, right. or they might be a smaller profile person they won't be removed so then what is that all about right, right. like if, if, if it's only a person who has 20,000 followers or higher we're gonna th- I mean it's just so you just can't do it there's just too many layers uh, I mean I'm against it just generally but just in terms of the logistics it doesn't make any sense I'm against it generally too and when I talked to Jack and he was explaining to me the problems with trying to manage things at scale you really kind of get a sense of it. Like, oh, you guys are dealing with billions and billions, billions of humans using these things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and But they're already, you know, in, in, in many countries around the world, they have armies of thousands of people who go through content to try to flag this or that kind of political content. Yeah. You know? And punish I mean, people. Yeah. yeah. They have, you know, in Ger- Germany has... I can, oh God, I forget what the term was. They have this, some some really scary sort of authoritarian word for like filtration centers or for something like that. Um, you know, the Chinese have have um, sort of armies of people. I mean, I, I did a story about Facebook and how it was, you know, teaming up with groups like the the Atlanta Council here in the United States. Remember a couple of years ago, uh, the Senate called in Twitter, Facebook, and Google to Washington and asked them to devise strategies for pre- preventing the sowing of discord, you know, so they basically it was asking them to come up with strategies for, for filtering out um, fake news and then also certain kinds of offensive content. But, you know, that is a stepping stone to what we've, we've seen in other countries, I think, you mm. know, and I, I think it's really worrisome, but, but nobody seems to care on, on our side of the aisle, which is, which is very strange. My well, side of the aisle. Anyway, it's yeah. my side of the aisle as well. It's a, it's a censorship issue, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's a short-sighted thing, as you said before. It's people, and it's not even. There's people that do pretty egregious things from the left, like the Covington um, school thing. When people were saying we got to dox these kids and re- give me their names, release their names, these people are still on Twitter to this day. Right. You're talking about kids that just happen to have these "Make America Great Again" hats. And I have a friend who used to live in that area said, "Like, no, you don't get it. Like, there's these stands. These kids are on a high school like field trip. There's these stands. We could buy these hats everywhere. These kids bought the hats there. They think they're being funny. These guys play the music and then get in their face. You take a photo of it. It looks like this guy's standing in this Native American." American guy's face but then you see the whole video and it's no, no no the Native American guy was playing his drum walking towards him 
and then everybody starts piling Yeah, everybody in. just loses Limited their minds, you know what I yeah. mean? It's this it's outrage cycle. It's just so exhausting and now, you know? And signaling. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. signaling how virtuous they are. Everyone's signaling that they're on the right side. Everyone's signaling, you know, I want names. Take these guys down. Like, you're talking about 16-year-old kids. Right. It's so fucking crazy. And all, what is he, Vic, he's, a, he's guilty of smiling? Right. Is that what he guilt, he's guilty of? Yeah. No, he's got a MAGA hat on. I mean, yeah, it's it's crazy, and the, the signaling thing is crazy. And, you know, for me, the, in, the, in the news business, a lot of people that I know went into, the, went into journalism precisely because we didn't want to talk about our political views. Like, the whole point of the job is, like, you know, we're just going to tell you what the facts are, like, I'm not going to tell you right. what, I, what I'm all about. You can't do that anymore. Everything's the, editorialized. Everything is about ed- ed- editorializing and signaling. It's just like what you're saying. You're, you're, you're telling people what your stance is on things, and that's that's the opposite of what the job used to be. And this is, again, one of the things I've been trying to, to focus on is that you know, it's exactly what you're talking about. People used to go to the news because they wanted to find out what happened in the world, and they can't do it anymore because everything that you turn on, every kind of content – is just editorialized content where people are sort of telling you where, where they stand on things. And, you know, I don't want to know that. I want to know what the information yeah, is. It's you know? so hard. How does this get resolved? Because we're dealing with essentially a two-decade-old problem, mm-hmm. right? I mean, give or take. Before that, before the this, the social media and before the internet and websites, this just, just wasn't – this wasn't what it was. You could count on the New York Times to give you an unbiased version of what's going on in the world. I don't necessarily know that's true anymore. No, no. The Times has kind of gone over to this model as well. I mean, they're they've super been, woke. They've they've struggled with it. They there were the, there was an editorial, and I, I wrote about this in the in the book that the in the summer of 2016, this guy Jim Rutenberg wrote this this piece said Trump is testing the norms of objectivity. That was the name of the piece. Mm. And uh, basically, what he said is Trump is so bad that we have to like rethink what objectivity means. We have to not only be true, but true to history's judgment. He said, and we have to have copious coverage and, aggre- co- and aggressive coverage. So we're going to cover Trump a lot. We're going to cover him aggressively, and we're going to show you. We're going to take a stand on on this issue rather than just tell you what happened, mm. right? So rather than doing the traditional New York Times thing of just the facts, we'll tell you. You sort it out, right? You you, you figure it out. We're going to tell you, you know, kind of how to how, what your stance should be, and um, you know, I think where does where do we go from here? How does it get resolved? I don't know because you know, unless the the, the financial incentives change. They're they're not going to change, you know. Uh, the the business used to be back when you were talking about with the New York Times, and then there were three networks, and they were all trying to get the whole audience, right? So they were they were they were doing that kind of neutral fact finding mission, and it, it was working for them financially. Now they can't do that because of the internet. It's it's you're hunting for audience in little groups, yeah, and they're just giving you hyper politicized stuff because that's the only way they can make money. I don't know how we change it. I don't know how we go, you know, we reverse it. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's so interesting, though, because, I mean, if you looked at human interactions and if you, you looked at, you know, dispensing news and information and you followed trends from, like, the 30s to the 40s to the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, he'd be like, oh, well, people are getting better at this. People are getting back, and then whoa, whoa, whoa! What the fuck is going on now? Everything's off the rails. Yeah. There's two camps barking at each other. There's blatant misinformation on both sides, blatant distortions of the truth, blatant editorializing of facts. And you're like, well, hey, what happened, guys? Yeah, no, it's 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 crazy, and and not not that the news didn't have distortions yes. before. Like you think about. You know, th- we covered up all all sorts of things. You know, massacres in Cambodia, f- secret bombing. You know, uh, use of Agent Orange, like stuff like that, just didn't appear in the news in the, way, in the degree it, it should. Now, though, you turn on either MSC, NBC, or Fox, and you're right. You, you'll you'll find something that's just totally full of shit within five minutes, y- yeah. y- usually, and uh, that. Y- did not used to be the case you know i think individual reporters used to take a lot of pride in their work you know um and it's different now now and now when you make mistakes in the business you don't 
you don't get bounced out of the business uh, in the way you used to, and that's that's really strange. Like only plagiarism, right? Plagiarism still bounces you. Doesn't it pl- it? Plagiarism can, is, is pretty. Yeah, that's usually fatal, right? You're not going to usually recover from that. I mean, some people have kind of near in, uh, problems with that, and they they you know I'm not going to yeah names, okay. but but um, but no, but you think about people who got stories like w the wmd thing wrong right not only did they not get bounced out of the business they all got promoted you know they're like they're ed- editors of major magazines now or you know and and so what does that tell people in the business well it tells you you know if you screw up as long as you screw up with a whole bunch of other people it's okay mm. you know which is not good and and we used to have a lot of pride about that stuff in this business and now we now we don't anymore um you know, it, it, it's there isn't the shame connected with with screwing something up that there used to be. I think there's a real danger with in terms of social media, especially in not complying to the Constitution, not complying to the First Amendment. I think there's a real danger in that, and I, I don't think we recognize that danger because I don't think we saw what social media was until it was too late. And then by the time it was too late, we had already had these sort of uh, standards in place, and the people that run it were already getting away with enforcing their own personal bias, their ideological bias. And this is this is at when you're at this position where you go, well, how does that ever get resolved? They're not going to resolve it on their own. They're still making ass loads of money. What do you do? Does the government resolve it? Well, if Trump steps in and resolves it, it looks like he's trying to resolve it to save his own political career or right. to to, you know, to help his supporters. It's like yeah, no, and, and and no matter what, if Trump does anything about it, automatically everyone's going to be against it, right? Right? You know, even even if it's um, even if there's some sense in there somewhere, people won't won't uh, won't get behind it. But and no. if they do anything about it, there's going to be a correction time. There's going to be a a gab time where it's going to be like that, where it's just going to f- a flood with people that are just like with this newfound freedom. They're just going to go pew, 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 <laughs> to shoot up the town, you know. But I mean, but how would you how would you fix it now? That, that's yes. the thing because it's not only about rules; it's also about culture. Like yeah. people have already they're in this pattern of, you know, not saying the wrong thing, right? And they don't. I, I think there's we're in a culture that doesn't even really know how to deal with free speech if we actually had it in the same way we used to. You know, no one seems to have a forecast. Like right. no one's like, well, the storm is going to last about four years, and then it's like, there's no, there's no forecast. No, no everyone's I'm, like, well, uh, so fucking the uncharted waters. Right, right. But if you historically, the tendency is once you have a tool that kind of can be used to um, keep people in line and for, enforce compliance of ideas, and uh, then it always ends up worsening and becoming more and more dictatorial and authoritarian. I mean, yes. I think you, again, you go back to the Soviet example, like once they started, you know, really exercising a lot of control over the press and literature and things like that, it, it didn't get better, you know, right. it, it just continued becoming more of a, you know, an entrenched thing until, so I, that's what I worry about. I think we're headed more in that direction yeah you know? i think so too i'm not really con- i'm just really concerned with uh, on both sides when people dig their heels in ideologically the other side just gets even more convinced they're correct oh yeah yeah and there's no cross dialogue of any kind no. anymore there and even now i mean it's it, it's interesting if you had you had bernie sanders on your show and Sanders, Sanders is one of the few politicians left who has this idea that we should talk to everybody. Like, there's, there are no illegitimate audiences out there. there are no, and, like, you know, that's my job as a politician is to try to convince you of things. But that's not normal in the Democratic Party anymore. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, uh, you know, has made a big thing about not going on Fox and about having certain people taken taken off Twitter. And and, yeah. and, and I, I think that's increasingly the the sort of line of thought in mainstream democratic party thought now is is that we're just going to rule out whatever whatever that is 47 percent of the electorate we're just not going to talk to them anymore right right i mean I, I i don't know how that that can possibly be a successful political strategy no, and what it, and what the point is you know i yeah i don't know it's no weird. it doesn't make any sense um i was reading something where people are going after tulsi gabbard for being on uh, tucker carlson she's like i'll talk to everybody like, and I'm, I'm glad she does. I mean, and by the way, it's like it's hard for her because she's kind of an outside candidate. It's hard for her to get time on these other networks. 
And so they want to punish her for being on Tucker Carlson's. And then they have this, you know, reductionist view of who he is. He's a white supremacist. Like, oh, well, he, she supports white supremacists. She goes on a white supremacist show. Like, okay, is that what he is? Right. Is that really what he is? And he's, it's neat, a lot more than that. There's a lot going on there. Right. This is, you guys are fucking with life. Yeah. You know, you're fucking with the, the reality of life and you're saying it in these sentences. You're printing it out in these paragraphs as fact and you're sending it out there irresponsibly. And it's just really strange that people don't understand the rebirth Cushions of that. Yeah, this is something we talk about on our podcast usually. It's all the time. Is that the, the this? It, it's a catch twenty two, right? Like you you don't invite somebody like Tulsi Gabbard on to CNN and MSNBC, or you, you, they're kind of excluded from the same platforms right. the other politicians get. So they go to other platforms, right? And then you say, oh, you went on that platform, so you're illegitimate. Yes. You know, well, what do you want them to do? Like, you know, right. they do the same thing with people who go on RT, for instance, right? Oh, well, you're helping the Russians because you went on RT. Well, that's because you didn't invite them on any. I mean, yeah. You, people are going to try to talk to anybody they can to, to, to spread their ideas. And that, that, that kind of propaganda thing is, is pretty constant now. In the use of the term, terms like what white supremacist with Tucker Carlson. I mean, there are, there are a million terms now that you use to just kind of throw at people. And what they're trying to do is create this ick factor around people, yes. right? Like once you get, someone gets a label associated with them, then nobody wants to be associated with that person, right? right. And then they quickly kind of die out of the public scene. And, and, and that's, I think that's really bad too. You know, it's, it's like a, it's it's just an anti-intellectual way of dealing with things, and I and, and I think it's uh, it's not good. It's weird that it's so prevalent. Mm-hmm. It's weird that there's so few proponents of uh, a more um, you know uh, open-minded way of thinking. Right. Yeah. And just to take the gap, we had we had Tulsi Gabbard on, on our show too, and immediately we got accused. What do you love Assad? <laughs> right. Uh, do you do you want to bomb Syrian? You want to keep murder Syrian children? No. I you know. I, She's a presidential candidate. You know, we want to talk. We want to hear what she has to say, but they they immediately go to the maximalist interpretation of yeah. everything, and then they're what they're basically saying when they ask you those questions are: Do you want to wear that label too? Right. Because she's got it already. Right. So if you have her on again, you're 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 going to have that label. Yeah. And people they see that, you sure. know. And and so you know people who have who don't have a big following and who are who are worried about their careers and about, you know, the money and advertisers and stuff like that, they they think twice about, you know, interviewing that person the next time. Yeah, And exactly. that's another way to get at speech. Exactly. And again, I don't know how you get out of it, you know? And, I mean, I've experienced some blowback, I guess, but it doesn't hasn't worked yet. Right. You know what I mean? It's not real. It's, it's like, it's just words. I'm like, okay. You well, but yeah, and and but you're handling it the right way, Ben. I think, I think people, your audience is rewarding you for for not um, not bowing to it, you know. And I think that more people, if they took that example and said, "I'm not going to listen to what the the pack says about this. I'm not going to be afraid of being called a name," you know, fuck that. I'm going to talk to who I want to talk to, and I'm going to I'm going to ha- you know explore whatever ideas I want to explore. Um, then th- this th- kind of stuff wouldn't be as effective. Um, so yeah, but it's so easy to do to people, and it's so easy to de- for them to deplatform people. Yeah, it's so easy and shadow banning and all this other weird shit that's going on. Yeah, they're channeling people and 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 p- pushing people into these areas of their platforms that makes them less accessible. And I know where it comes from. I mean, I'm, I, I was I was young and politically active once. You know, you you want to change the world. You yes. want to make it a better place. So you're in college, and you don't have any power. You don't have any uh, way to in, put make something into legislation. You know what I mean? You, so what do you do? You, you you know, social media gives you the illusion that you're having an impact in the world by you know, maybe getting somebody deplatformed or taken off Twitter or something like that. It feels like it's political action to people, yeah, exactly. but it's not, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's something that they, that is open to people to do, but it's not the same as, you know, getting 60 Congress, 60 members of the Senate to, to raise taxes on a corporation that's been evading them for 20 years. You know what I mean? Like that's, right. that's real action. Um, 
this, you know, getting some random person taken off the internet is just not change, you know, but, but people feel like it is and, and they want to, they want to do the right thing. So I, I, I get it, but I don't know. It's, it's not, you know, p- real political action. I don't think. No, it's fucking gross. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. And it just le- it's, there's so much of it and also, there's so little logic. Also, and, and, you, you, this must be a, a personal thing for you, but is this, isn't this the unfunniest time in American history? Like humor yes is and never, no, yeah? because you're rewarded for for stepping outside of the box. That's true in a That's big true. way. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you mean Dave Chappelle gets attacked, but guess what? He also gets rewarded in a huge way. Right. When he goes on stage now. People go ape shit that's true and part of the reason why they go fucking bonkers is because they know that this guy doesn't give a fuck and he's one of the rare ones who doesn't give a fuck so when he goes up there you know if he thinks something crazy about whatever it is whatever protected group or whatever idea that he's not supposed to explore that's not going to stop him at all he's going to tell you exactly what he thinks about those things regardless of all this woke blowback he's not he doesn't care right and so because of that he's rewarded even more and same thing with bill burr same thing with a lot of comics. I experience it with my own jokes. Sure. The more controversial bits get m- people more fired up now. They love it because everyone's smothered. They're smothered by human resources and smothered by office politics and you're smothered by social discourse uh, restrictions and you just don't feel like you can express yourself anymore. That's it's, true. And, and, and all people also don't have a they feel like they're being watched all the time. Yeah, is another thing. So they sure. feel like they kind of can't let it all hang out anywhere, yeah. right? And and so that's yeah, they, they they do feel incredibly like repressed and under the gun. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's that's true. Yeah, I, I just I feel like it. I mean, I'm not a comic, but I, but I just imagine it must be a, a, a more challenging environment. It's more it, challenging, but more rewarding, too. Right, My friend yeah. Ari said it best. He said, this is a great time for comedy because comedy's dangerous again. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's it, true. Yeah. It kind of goes, goes back to like the Lenny Bruce era, right? Yes. Yeah. When, when you, know, you, you could kind of completely freak people out with a couple, saying a couple of things. Sure. Yeah. 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 For good or bad. Richard Pryor. You know? Yeah. Well, you, like, you, you saw it with like Louis C.K., right? Well, Louis mm-hmm. C.K.'s under the microscope now that joke that he made about parkland is absolutely a louis ck joke if you have followed him throughout his career what was the joke again i'm sorry the joke was why am i listening to these parkland survivors why are you interesting because you push some fat kid in the way (laughs) like see you're laughing (laughs) right like that is a louis ck joke he's saying something fucked up that you're not supposed to say that is throughout his goddamn career he's done that that's what he's always done but after the um you know jerking off in front of women all that stuff and him coming out and admitting it and then taking a bunch of time off now he's a target so now he does something like that and they're like oh he's all right now like like no this is what he's always done right he's always taking this sort of contrarian outside the box fucked up but hilarious take on things and that bit unfortunately because it was released by someone who made a youtube video of it he didn't get a chance to he was gone for 10 months and he had only done a couple sets when he was fleshing these ideas out i guarantee you he would have turned that idea into a brilliant bit but he never got the chance because mm-hmm. it was just it was set out there in the wild when it was a baby and it was mauled down by wolves it, it needed to be it needed <laughs> to grow right yeah i mean that's what a bit of these bits they they grow and they develop and that was a, a controversial idea that we're supposed to think that someone's interesting just because they survived a tragedy and his take is like no 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 you're not interesting right you're fucking boring you're annoying get off my get off my tv <laughs> and a lot of us have felt that way sure he, he just the way he said it was easy to take and put in you know out of context put it in quotes and turn him into an asshole. Well, yeah, but that's what comedy is, right? It's it's taking what people the, the thoughts that everybody has and and vocalizing that thing, yes. that yes. forbidden thing, in, yes. in a way that people can kind of you know uh, come together over, right? Yes. I mean, I think that was a lot of a lot of what Richard Pryor's humor was about. Like he 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 took a lot of the sort of uncomfortable race uh, problems, right? And he just kind of put them out there, and both white people and black people laughed at it, yes. right? Like, together, you know? Yes. And that, that was what was good about it. Yes. But if you can't, um, if, if 
people are afraid to vocalize those things that they think it's going to you know ruin their career. I mean, I guess you know that that makes it more interesting, right? It's it does. More, it's more high more high stakes. But so. if you can navigate those waters and get to the promised land of the punchline, it's even more rewarding, right? But you just have to explain yourself better. You have to have better points. You have to have you have to have a better structure to your material where you, you while the the people who may find your idea objectionable they you you coax them like hold my hand i'm going to take you through the woods we're going to be okay right. follow me and boom isn't that funny right 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 but you have to navigate it skillfully and you have to navigate it thoughtfully and you have to really have a point you can't have a half ass point but it, you can't have a situation where it's fatal to be off by a little bit. Right. You know, like there, there was a writer that I loved growing up, a, a Soviet writer named Isaac Babel. Uh, Stalin ended up shooting him. Um, but he gave a speech about, uh, I think it was in 1936, you know, to, to a Soviet writer's collective. And he said, you know, people say that we don't have as much freedom as we used to. But actually, all, they've, all that, uh, you know, the, the Communist Party has done is, pre is prevented us from writing badly. The only thing that's outlawed now is writing badly, right? And everybody laughed. But he was actually saying something pretty serious, which is that you can't write well unless you can you know, screw up too, you know what right. I mean? Like on the way to, to, to being creative in a good way, you have to miss, Yes. you know? And if missing is not allowed uh, and there's high punishment for missing, you're not going to get art. Yes. You're not going to get revelation. You're not going to get all these things. Well, and in comedy, it's particularly important because you have to work it out in front of people. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I used to sit at a comedy club in, in Man Manhattan when I was a, uh, uh, in college, uh, you know, they would try out their material like on a Wednesday, right? You know, early, and that was always the most interesting time for me. Like when they're trying out stuff out, and a lot of it wasn't so good, but you know, it was interesting, right? And it, you just can't have a situation where people feel like you know one wrong word is going to ruin their careers. Yeah, just, you know. Yeah, I don't know. But there's also people that are wolves, and they're trying to take out that little baby joke wandering through the woods. <laughs> they they want that feeling of being ta able to take someone down. Right. And that that's you know that's you're getting that now too, which is just. And so now because of that, there's like yonder bags at like the improv where I'm performing tonight. They they use yonder bags. You have to put your cell phone in a bag when you go in there, so you can't record things yonder like, bags yes yeah, it's, it's a company called yonder it's just so strange it's uh, like uh, all the shows i did with Chappelle, he uses yonder bags and yeah. the idea is to prevent people from from filming and recording uh -huh. and you know and then eventually putting your stuff out there uh -huh. well you know look i, I i'm kind of all for that i mean I, i've seen this with politicians on the campaign trail like, they are so tight now in ways that they used to not be. Well, you saw the Donald Trump thing, Donald Trump Jr., where Trump Jr., was, they didn't want him to do, they wanted him to do a Q&A, and he didn't want to do it, so they, they booed him. The right-wing people uh -huh. were booing him. They were yelling out, Q&A, Q&A, because they wanted to be able to talk. Oh, I they see. They wanted to be able to say something to him. And these were people that were, like, far right, mm -hmm. far right people. They just didn't think he was being right enough, or he was playing the game wrong, or he wasn't wasn't letting them complain to him. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, that's bad, and and. and Politicians are, are are aware of that now, and they're they're constantly aware that they're they're on film everywhere, and so they're you know a thousand percent less interesting because yeah they're they're I mean I remember covering campaign in two thousand and four, and I was I saw Dennis Kucinich give a speech somewhere, and he was going from I think Maine to New Hampshire, and I said well, can I get a ride back to New Hampshire? He's like yeah sure, so he you know takes me on the the van, he like takes his shoes off. He's like cracking jokes and everything, and like eating udon noodles or something. Political candidates would not do that now. Like right? they'd be afraid mm. to be off the record with you, right? You know, right, right. And and they they're afraid to be around people and just behave like people, you know, uh, which is is not good. I don't think it's the weirdest time ever to be a politician because it's it's basically you've got this one guy who made it through being f hugely flawed. Mm -hmm. And just going, ah, fucking locker room talk. And everyone's like, well, yeah, it is locker room talk, I guess. And then it works, and he gets through and he wins. And so you've got him who seems like he's so greasy, like nothing sticks to him. And then you have everyone else who's terrified of any slight misstep. Yeah, totally. And, and you can't replicate the way Trump 
does this. You know, Trump Trump is he was born this way. There's like a thing going on in his head. Like he is, you know, pathologically driven to behave in a certain way and he's not going to be cowed by the way, you know, people are about social media because he just doesn't think that way. No. You know, he's and but that's no one else is going to behave like that. What do you think about him and speed? What do you does think about all that? Does he take speed, you mean? Yeah. So did you ever see his speech after Super Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the one where he was slurry. He oh, was, no, was that, that was the one where he was ramped up? He was very I, – I, I just say watch that speech. You know, we're, we're not supposed to draw conclusions about but, you know, what, what might be going on pharmaceutically with somebody. But I would say just watch Donald, Donald Trump's performance after – the results of the t- Super Tuesday rolled in in 2016. Let's hear some of that. First of all, well, the Chris, right. Christie is hilarious. I watched Hillary's speech, and she's talking about wages have been poor, and everything's poor, and everything's doing badly, but we're going to make it. She's been there for so long. I mean, if she hasn't straightened it out by now, she's not going to straighten it out in the next four years. It's just going to become worse and worse. She wants to make America whole again, and I'm trying to figure yeah. out what is that all about. Is this it? Yeah, make I mean, it just, I, 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 I have to go back speech, and look, yeah. but yeah, but he, 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 he went on and on. Also, the, 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 the Christie factor was really funny with that because he was look like, at he, him. he's just sitting back there going, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? Look at his face. He, literally, you could see his, his brain wander. Well, how the fuck did this happen? I was going to be the man. Like, I was the goddamn president. <laughs> it was going to happen for me. I could see it happening. I saw him in, uh, in Ames, Iowa. Um, basically standing alone in the park waiting for people to try to shake his hand oh, you know Jesus. yeah it was pretty bad like you see that and but yeah do you have a theory about trump and speed yeah 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 i think he's on some stuff mm-hmm. i think first of all i know so many journalists that are on speed i know so many people that are on adderall mm-hmm. and it's very effective mm-hmm. it gives you confidence it gives you a delusional perspective like you get a delusional state of confidence. Mm-hmm. It makes people think they can do anything. It's basically a low-level meth. It's very similar to methamphetamine chemically. Yeah, sure. And people have done it. Yeah. <laughs> what is? Tell me what it's like because I haven't done it. Yeah, I mean, I have done speed too. I mean, you know, all, all those all those drugs are yeah, they're, they're like baby baby speed basically. Yeah. You know, and you're you're absolutely right. I think people who it's not good for a writer because writing is one of these things where. One of the most important things is being able to step back and, and, and ask, am I really, am I full of shit here? Is, you know, are my jokes as funny as I think they are? Like, right. if once that mechanism starts to go wrong, uh, you know, you're really lost as, yeah. as a writer, right? Because you're, just, you're not in front of an audience. You're with yourself in front of a computer. So um, I, don't think, I don't think speed is a great drug. I mean, you, you get a lot of stuff done. Um, so that's, that's good. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of people who are on it now. And, and also a lot of this because kids come up through school and they're on it too, yes. you know, and they, they get used to it. So I, uh, you know, I have kids, I wouldn't dream of giving, giving them any of those drugs. No. You know, I think it's crazy. Yeah. I do too. Did you see, you saw the, I'm sure you saw the Sudafed picture too, right? No. What was that? Was, uh, Trump was sitting in his office eating a, it was that famous photo where he's like, I love Hispanics, where he's eating a uh, taco bowl <laughs> at Trump Tower and behind him there's an open drawer and in that open drawer is boxes of Sudafed. And um, Sudafed, yeah, Sudafed it gives you, yeah, I mean, you, it gives you a, a low level buzz. And the the th- I mean, this is why you used to have to go to uh, CVS to buy this stuff. You used to have to give your drivers. I guess you still do. You have to give your drivers license because they want to make sure you're not cooking meth. You know, right. buying like ten boxes of it at a time and cooking up a batch. Yeah, if you're like in a, in a holler in Kentucky and you go in and you get twenty twenty boxes of Sudafed, yeah. I think pretty much people know what you're doing there. Yeah, that's really funny. Did he, so he had a bunch of Sudafed behind yes. him. Yes. Yeah, in his box. And, you know, there was that one reporter that, uh, what was that guy's name again? Who had a, a whole, he wrote a, a series of tweets, which he eventually wound up taking down, by the way, Jamie. I can't find those fucking tweets. Um, he wrote a series of tweets that there was a very specific Dwayne Reed Pharmacy where Trump got uh, amphetamines for uh, something that was in quotes called metabolic disorder. Kurt Eichenwald. Fun oh, fact. Oh, Kurt, yeah. 1982, Trump started taking amphetamine derivatives, abused them, only supposed to take two for 25 days, stayed on them for eight years. Really. Now, is he full of shit? So, yeah, Kurt Eichenwald is an interesting because he's written some really good books about finance. Um, he, wrote, he wrote a book about Enron. He wrote a book about... Um, 
uh, Prudential. It was really, really good. Uh, and when I was starting out writing on Wall Street, I was like, wow, these books are really incredibly well researched. But he had some stuff in the uh, in 2016 where, like, that's an example of something. As a reporter, I see that. I'm like, well, where's that coming from? You know, and because you, you in journalism, you can't really. Uh, accuse somebody of certain things unless it's backed up to the nth degree. So right. he, he had a couple of things that I that I you know would be concerned about. He days. took a leap. Mm, I don't know. I mean, look, it, but, I, but that's what I'm saying. Stepped outside of the journalistic boundaries of what you can absolutely prove and not prove, and took a leap. And that's why I think he took down the Dwayne Reed pharmacy. He didn't take it down. Oh, it's still there, there as well. There was an. Uh, oh, okay. There it is. There was another thing about a. Um, oh, he's got the milligrams per day. Wow. Where is this from? The, I don't know. It doesn't show it or anything, but I believe he drug got is, a copy of it from someone or he talked to the doctor. Or. Drug was diethylpropin, 75 milligrams a day, prescription filled at Dwayne Reed on 57th Street in Manhattan. Not that I know things. So, you know. He's got the doctor's name, too. Dr. Joseph Greenberg. I uh, counter with medical records. A White House admitted to me. Only a short time for diet that he took it when he was oh, not well, overweight. Well, okay, then that's fine. He says, I countered with medical records. They cut me off. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I will say is that when you're, when you're covering stories, sometimes um, you hear things and, and you know they're pretty solid, but you put, you, it's not quite reportable because the person won't put their name on it mm. or, you know, you're not 100% sure that the document is a real document. Maybe right. it's a photocopy. And that, that can be very, very tough for reporters because they know something's true, but they, they, they can't. Right. They can't. And, and social media has eliminated a barrier that we used to have. We used to have to go through editors and fact checkers. And now, you know, you're on Twitter. You can just kind of, boop, you know. Right, right, and, right. Or you can hint at something, you right. know. And I, I, I think that's that's something you don't want to get into as, as a reporter too much, you know. Yeah, that's a weird use of social media, right? It's like sort of a slippery uh, escape from journalistic rules. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, or, or you can... You can insinuate that somebody did X, Y, and Z, or you can you you can use terms that are a little bit sloppy, like you know, again, like. But it the, seems like they did admit that he took that stuff for diet. Yeah. So if you have the the White House, uh, you know, spokesperson saying that they he took it for a short time for a diet, then you're fine. That's a reportable story. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think when people get into that shit, it's very hard for them to get out of that shit. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the the speed train, and I've seen many people hop on it. It's got a lot of stops. <laughs> Nobody seems to get off. <laughs> yeah, not not with their teeth intact, right? Yeah, no, it's uh, that's that's not a good. Also, good he's way to so end. old. He's so old. He doesn't exercise. He eats fast food, and he's got so much fucking energy. I, know. I mean, people want to think he's this super person, you know, but maybe he's on speed. Maybe, yeah, and maybe he's just gonna collapse, turn over, and collapse one or day. Or not. Maybe yeah. you can go a lot longer on speed than people think. Maybe if you just do it the right way. But isn't that kind of the way history always works? It's like, again, not to go back to the Russia thing, but all the various terrible leaders of Russia, like they all died of natural causes when they were 85, right? Whereas <laughs> you know, in, in a country where people get murdered and die of industrial accidents and bad health when they're you know 30 all the time, right, right? But the worst people in the country make it to very old age and, and you know and die and, and they're alcoholics and and maybe that's a thing, right? Maybe maybe you know. He has the worst diet in the world, and maybe he's on speed. And maybe you know. it's also your perception of how you interface with the world. Maybe because he's not this introspective guy that's really worried about how people see him and feel about him. Maybe he doesn't feel, you know, whether it's sociopathy or whatever it is, he doesn't feel the bad feelings. They don't get in there. Yeah, and this, he doesn't have the the stress impact, right? right? And know, that's the thing about speed. Apparently, it, because of the fact that it makes you feel delusional, and it makes you feel like you're the fucking man. Like right. you don't worry about what other people think. These fucking losers. Who cares? Right. Right. Yeah. Let's exactly. buy Greenland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know that was why not buy Greenland? Why not buy Greenland? Yeah. And yeah. when that came out, I thought, well, what's wrong with that? We bought Alaska. Well, yeah. we leased Alaska, sort yeah. of. Yeah, we were supposed to give it back, but we, we didn't. It seems is. like Greenland would be a good place to scoop up, especially as things get warmer. Right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And The then, fucking you know, tweet that he made when he put the Trump Tower, I promise not to do this, and have a giant <laughs> Trump Tower in the middle of Greenland, I was laughing my ass off. I'm like, 
His, love or hate that is hilarious his trolling skills are are top notch very good they're they're fantastic oh he yeah. knows how to fuck with people mm -hmm. when he starts calling people crazy or gives him a nickname like it's so good because like he, it sticks it oh, sticks yeah. I mean, the, part of me wants to see a Trump-Biden race next year just for that reason, <laughs> just because the the abuse will be unbelievable. I mean, not that I'm encouraging that necessarily, but just as a spectacle, it's going to be unbelievable. You can tell that he he is salivating at the idea of, of Biden of as course. an opponent. Yeah. Biden, to me, is like having a flashlight with a dying battery and going for a long hike in the woods. <laughs> It is not going to work out. It's not going to make it. Yeah, no, he's... He's so faded. He, he you know, he has these moments on, on the campaign trail where he'll be speaking, and, you know, these guys do the same speech over and over again, so they can kind of do it on cruise control, but every now and then he'll he'll stop in the middle of it, and you, you this look of terror comes over, like, where am I? Yeah. You know, what town am I in? You know, oh. like, he... he can, he confused. He thought he was in Vermont uh, when he was in New Hampshire. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was. He got those states confused. But he's like, what's not to love about Vermont? He was in New Hampshire. Uh, you know, the, that can happen, obviously, yeah. but it happens to him a lot. But well, he's clearly old. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's not much older than Trump. Right. But he needs to get on the same pills. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Stop that would be interesting. Around. We should get a GoFundMe to buy. Speed. Can you imagine? Yeah. If for... they just filled him up with steroids and and just jacked him up with amphetamines and <laughs> had him going after Trump. Because <laughs> be... I, I really think he needs something like that. He, whatever he's doing on the Natch, it's not working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's he too needs, tired. Needs a little bit of enhancement. It's not going to work. If he if he gets the nomination, the Democrats are fucked. I just I don't see I I don't see him. I don't see him withstanding the barrage that Trump is going to throw at him. Trump's going to take him out like Tyson took out Marvis Frazier. He's just oh, going to bomb a bad on fight. him. Yeah. That, was a bomb. that was a bad fight. Yeah. But it's going to be that kind of fight. Right, He's just right. going to bomb on him. Yeah. He doesn't have a chance. He can't stand with that guy. He doesn't have a chance. He's, too, he's also too impressed with himself. Yes, he's too used to people deferring yes, to him. Yes, like and, he know. thinks like the things he says make sense and are cool and are profound when they're just bland. Right. He's just serving bad meatloaf. <laughs> and he's like, ta-da! And you're like, no, this is bad meatloaf. Yeah, that's how he got to be vice president, by being just bland enough yes. right, to, to get whatever constituency Obama was trying to get. But you, you saw that exchange when he, he called Trump an existential threat earlier this year, and Trump basically, he just went off on him. You know, Joe, Joe's a dummy. He's not the guy he used to be. Like, you know, yeah, that's going to be every day, yep. you know, every minute of every day. And then other people are going to chime in because they love it. People love piling on. Oh, yeah. And his fans, oh, my God. The, he's the asshole king. Where people never had a representative before. There's a lot of assholes out there like, ah, where's my guy? Right. And then finally, bam, look at this. There he is. The asshole made it to the White House. <laughs> Holy shit, I can be an asshole now? The president's an asshole? He wants me to be an asshole? Lock her up. Lock her up. Yeah, lock her up. Yeah, oh, yeah totally. <laughs> like, all that's... I mean that that's gonna wear on a guy. I mean, have you been to one of Trump's rallies? No chance. Yeah, no, I can't. I, I have, have to wear I, a rubber nose and fucking. I've covered them, and what's they're, it like? They're unbelievable. First of all, the the the, the t-shirts are amazing. You know, it, like Trump twenty twenty. Fuck your feelings. Whoa, you know what I mean? Like, nice. <laughs> or Trump as the Punisher. You know, it's like the Punisher skull with the thing. Like, it's uh. it's uh, <laughs> it's it's amazing. And the in the crowds, it's like totally out of idiocracy. Is you know there a, I mean? is there a fucking Punisher skull with a Trump wig on it? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, I might have to get one of those. I mean, he's the, <laughs> there's. They're oh the oh. t-shirts are. <laughs> Let me see Do we it, have Jamie. one? <laughs> Jamie, that was such a loud laugh. <laughs> 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 oh Never my seen that. god! What a it's a red, white, and blue American flag skull Punisher style with a Trump Trump wig on it. So I saw that. I need that shirt. I saw it wasn't the one red, white, and blue one. It was the it was the one with the black. And I saw that oh on my god. on a uh, on like a, an eight year old kid. 
Oh right? My God. And it was like a mother with her little kids and the tr- Trump Punisher skull. But Do they sell that shirt on Amazon? Can you find out the show? I'm sure it's being <laughs> sold everywhere. <laughs> it is now. Oh these my are God. stickers and these are being I sold. I know. Over well, Walmart, oh, eBay. oh, God. These fucking people. I mean, the the, the merch is, he is, he's the most t shirtable president in hi- uh, history. I mean, you know, Trump 2020 grabbing by the pussy uh, again. Oh, like, boy. I mean, they, they like embrace that shit it the 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 trolling aspect of of all of it is like the fun part for his crowds like sure what they get off on is how how freaked out you know quote-unquote liberal audiences are by their appearance their attitude and everything and they lean into it you know what i mean which is which is uh, interesting because you know that kind of like group camaraderie thing that you don't really find that on in the campaign trail on the Democratic side. It's different. I mean, it's a different vibe entirely. But yeah, it's crazy. Well, it's dumb, and that's oh, that's yeah. the thing that he's sort of like captured is this place where you can be dumb. Mm-hmm. Like it's fun to be dumb and say grab her by the pussy. Like everybody knows that's kind of a dumb thing to say publicly. Uh, of course, but you can say it there because he said it yay you know build that wall build that wall yay right like it's like it's this chance to like shut off any possibility of getting over like 70 rpm like you we're gonna cut this bitch off at 70 there's no high function here (laughs) we're gonna cut it off at 70 and just let it rip right yeah no totally totally and and it's funny the way you say that uh they all everybody knows it's a dumb thing to say right yes. so yeah, like i would talk to people at, at the crowds and you know i'll talk to like a 65 year old grandmother like and you say do you agree with everything that trump says and like almost to the last they all say well i wish he hadn't said this particular thing right but they're all there chanting you know what i mean yes. like they're all into it and all and, and the crowds are they're so huge like i was in cincinnati and I was late to one of his events, and I made the mistake that I, I couldn't drive in because they blocked off all the bridges, if you've ever been there, right? I was on the Kentucky side. So I had to walk, like, three miles away and, like, walk over a bridge, and I thought I was going to be the only person there. And it was like something out of a sci-fi movie. It was just, like, a line of MAGA hats, like, go, extending over a bridge all the way into Kentucky, like, a mile down a road. Wow. I mean, they had to turn away thousands of people to get into this event. It was in, it's incredible. How and many people the, did it seat? It was like seventeen or eighteen thousand. It was the, the you know the um, uh, I forget what they what arena that is. It's the it's the indoor one. In, in, Look at the size of those yeah. places. He's the only one that can pull those kind of crowds. Period. Oh yeah. There's yeah. no well, no one no one can do that. You know, Bernie and Warren have had big crowds. Bernie had a he had a twenty five thousand person crowd in in Queens a couple of weeks ago. You, you'll see crowds that big, but Trump's crowds are just. Dating back to 2016, they're just consistently huge every, everywhere. <laughs> and uh, and it, again, this gets back to what I was saying before. All the reporters saw this, and they all saw that Hillary was having real trouble getting four and 5,000 people into her events. And so we all, you know, we were all talking to each other like, that's got to be in it, a thing that's going to, you know, play a role in the election eventually. But nobody yeah. kind of brought it up or they, they explained it away. Well, I think they felt like if you discussed it and brought it up that somehow or another you got, you were contributing to Trump being uh, – to Trump winning. Right, but that's a, that's a fallacious way to look at it. Yeah. Because – Covering up the reality of the situation, I think, created a false sense of security for Democrats. Sure. And they thought they were going to win by a landslide, yeah. right? That's what everybody was saying, but it wasn't true. I mean, there were ser- there were serious red flags throughout the campaign for Hillary, and people, I think, were too afraid to, to bring up a lot of this stuff because they didn't want to be seen as helping Trump. But that's not what the business is about. We're not supposed to be, you know... Helping fac- people. Facts right. don't have, you know, political indications. We're just supposed to tell you what we see. How know? do you get journalism back on track? Is it possible at this point? I mean, is it is a lost art? Is it going to be like calligraphy? I mean, I think... <laughs> Yeah, calli- yeah, right. Yeah, like, like yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the Japanese calligraphy, right? You have to pass it down through masters. Yeah, for ages. yeah. And maybe that's that's going to be what journalism is like. I mean, then there's there's two things that could happen. One is that, like, if you created something like Neither Side News right now, right, Ooh, and just like a that's a great name. Yeah, like a network where it was a bunch of people who just kind of did the job without the editorializing. I think it would have 
it would probably have a lot of followers right away. It would make money. And nobody has clued into that yet. Like if, if some canny entrepreneur were to do that and that were to bring back the business, that or, you know, journalism has always been kind of quasi subsidized in this country. You know, going back to the Pony Express, newspapers were carried free across to the West, right? The U.S. Postal Service did that. The original 19, the Communications Act in 1934, the idea was, you know, we, you could lease the public airways, but you had to do something in the public interest. So mm. you, you, you could make money doing sports and entertainment, but you could take a loss on news. And so it, it was kind of quasi subsidized in that way. But it, it, that doesn't exist anymore. There's no subsidy really for news anymore. I'm not necessarily sure I agree with that, that being the way to go. But there has to be something because right now the financial pressure to be bad is just too is too great. Mm. You know, like there's no there's no way to. I'm sorry to go on this, but I came when I came from the business when the money started getting tighter. The first thing they got rid of were the long form investigative reporters. Like you couldn't just hire somebody to work on a story for three months anymore because you needed them to do content all the time. Then they got rid of the fact checkers, you know, which had another serious problem, you know, and. And so now the money's so tight that you just have these people doing clickbait all the time and they're not doing real reporting. And so they have to fix the money problem. I don't know how they would do that, though. How much has it changed recently? Because, like, when that piece that you, the stuff that you wrote about the banking crisis was my favorite coverage of it and the, the most relatable and understandable and the way you spelled everything out. Um, could you do that today? Yeah, but I, th- I think it would be harder because that's not that long ago. It's it, it it really isn't. It's only you know that was I really stopped doing that in like 2014 or so. Yeah, but, so we're five years out. But the the, the big difference is uh, social media has had a huge impact on attention span. So you know I was writing like 7,000 word articles about credit default swaps and stuff like that. And I was trying really hard to make it interesting for people. You know, you use jokes and yeah. humor and stuff like that. But now people would not have the energy to, to really fight through that. You'd have to make it shorter. Um, even TV, you know, they people, you don't see that kind of reporting, that in-depth you know, kind of process reporting where, you te- where you're teaching people something mm-hmm. because people just tune out right away. Like they, they need just a quick hit, a headline, and a couple of facts. So, yeah, there's a big problem with audience, right? We've, tr- we've trained audiences to consume the news differently, and all they really want to get is a take now. You know, it's like the everything's like an ESPN hot take right. on things, you know? So that's The, that's the counter to that, though, is this, what we're doing right now. Like these are always these long ass conversations. They're hours and hours long, and there's a bunch of them out there now. It's not mm-hmm. like mine is an isolated one. And there's so many podcasts that cover, and some of them co- cover them like in a serial form, like um, the dropout. Was that what that was that they called it? Yes, it was the dropout. Was the one about that woman who created that fake blood company? Oh yes, right. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, Susan. What was her name? Elizabeth. What is her name? <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes. Holmes. That's right. right. That's right. Theranos. Yeah. The the completely fraudulent company. That was an amazing podcast series. Absolutely. That if I read it, I probably, you're right. I probably would have like, oh, boring. Right. I probably would have abandoned it earlier. But listening to it in podcast form, listening to actual conversations from these people, listening to people's interpretations of these conversations, listening to people that were there at the time, telling, you know, telling stories about when they knew things were weird and when they started noticing the, the there's like tests that were incorrect that they were covering up that kind of shit like you can do that now with something like this and i think that one of the good things about podcasts too is you don't need anybody to tell you that you could you could publish this yeah no absolutely absolutely i think you're you're right and I'll, i think uh, formats like this reveal that the news companies are wrong about uh, about some things, about audiences. Like, they, they think that people can't handle an in-depth discussion about things. They think that audiences only want to watch 30 seconds of something. They don't. They're they're interested. They, they, they do have curiosity about things. It's just, uh, it's very difficult to con- convince people in the news business especially to take chances on that kind of content. You know, yeah. they'll, they'll do it for a podcast. They'll do it for a documentary. But um, but for for the news, they just they're making things shorter and shorter and shorter. You know, I was really lucky to have an editor who I you know so 
understood the idea that we have to get into this in, in depth or else it's going to be meaningless to people, right? right? Um, that's pretty rare. You know, for the most part, they you don't see them taking that kind of bet anymore. But maybe podcasts will help people punk puncture that. But the flip side of that is that they're not they're not investing in stuff like um, – like international news in the way they used to. Like when I came up in the business, every bureau, uh, every big network had bureaus in every major city around the world, you know, Rome, Berlin, Moscow, whatever it is, right? And they had newsrooms full of people who are, you know, out there gathering news. Now there's none of that, you know, right? Because they figured out they can make the money just as easily by having somebody sit in an office in, in Washington or New York and just you know, link to something and have a take on something, mm. you know? So the, the, I think the news is getting worse. Podcasts are getting more interesting. Maybe, maybe there's a happy medium they can find in between. Well, documentaries as well. Documentaries are commercially viable. If it's a great subject, like, um, like a good example is that wild, wild country one mm -hmm. where, you know, I didn't even know that that cult existed. I had right. no idea what, what happened up there. And then, so this, this documentary sheds light on it. It does it over like, I think it was like six episodes or something like that. And mm -hmm. It's fucking amazing, and it made a shit ton of money. Yeah, or making a murderer was another one yes. I think was really good. Like they, you, you take because that's something that happens all over the place. You have these criminal justice cases, and they're you know terrible injustices happen. Um, and you know if you if you really tell the whole story and make characters out of people and invest the time and energy yes. to, to tell tell it well, people still like really good storytelling. Um, but uh, but I think within the news business, they just they have this belief, their hard-headed belief, that people can't handle difficult material, and I don't know why that is. You know. Yeah, I don't know why it is either. It's, I mean, I think there's a large number of people that aren't satisfied intellectually by a lot of the stuff they're being spoon-fed, mm -hmm. and they think that because the the vast majority of things that are commercially viable are short attention span things. I think it's like this real sloppy way of thinking, non-risk taking way of thinking. They're like, "Listen, this is how people consume things. You got to give them like a music video style editing, or they they just tune out." But there's always been a thirst for actual long form conversations. You yeah, just, you don't an actual real in depth exploration of something in a in a very digestible way. Like one of the good things about doing your podcast or this podcast. Any podcast really is that you can listen to it while you're commuting. Mm -hmm. You listen to it and it'll actually give you something that occupies your mind and interests you during what would normally be dead time. Right. Yeah. And and you're absolutely right about the the, the thirst for something else. Yeah. And again, I think when people turn on most news products, they're they're getting this predictable set of things and that doesn't quench that thirst for them they're not they're not being challenged in any way they're not seeing different sides of a, of a topic you know you're not approaching uh covering a subject honestly by genuinely uh, you know exploring the idea that so that people you may have thought were bad or right or people you may have thought are good or wrong it's just all predictable so i think people are fleeing to other things now right they just they they want they want to just get the story they don't they don't want to have a whole lot of you know, editorializing on top of it, yeah, and and uh, yeah, and and they, I think also, there's a lot of underestimating of audiences going out there, and like we we just think that they can't handle stuff, and they can, yeah, yeah. They're, they're 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 interested, but we 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 just take it for granted that they can't do it. Maybe I'm guilty of that too, you know, because I've been doing this for so long. But but yeah, it it, it does happen. I don't think people have changed that much. Yeah, no, pro probably, probably not. It's just, um, it's just difficult, you know. Maybe it's also we don't have the the stamina to to stick with a story in the same way that we used to. Like now, if a story doesn't get a million hits right away, we don't we don't return to the subject. Hmm. You know, you think about stories like Watergate, like when Woodward and Bernstein first did those stories, they were complete duds. Like like everybody thought they were on the wrong path. They were the only people who were covering it. And a lot of those stories kind of flailed around. You know what I mean? They they didn't get the big response. And it wasn't until much later that it became this hot thing that everybody was watching. And you wouldn't so so that wouldn't happen now, right? Like if right. If, if reporters were on a story, if it didn't catch fire within the first couple of of passes, your editor's probably going to take you off it.
now. What was that story that the New York Times worked on about Trump, and they worked on it for a long time, and it was released and went in and out of the news cycle in a matter of days, and nobody gave a fuck? The Yeah, the what one was, about his finances. Yes. And it was like a 36,000-word story. It was like unbelievable. It was, it was, like, it was like six times as big as, any, as the biggest story I've ever written in and my life. They thought it was a giant takedown. Right, yeah. And it, it was. It, you're, it was like a 36 hour thing if that right and and maybe maybe yeah and people kind of said oh this is amazing it's got all this information in it and it just fell flat you know and that's and the important thing about that is that news companies see this and they say wow we invested all this time and money we put our you know really good reporters on this we gave them six months to work on something and it got the same amount of hits as you know some story about uh, you know a carp with a human face that was filmed in, in China. You know what I mean? Like some some thing that we you know we picked off the wires yeah. and we stuck it in, in page eleven, whatever it was. So then that what that tells them the in, the incentives now are let's not bother, let's let's not do six months invest, investigations of anything anymore because what's the point? We're going to get right. as many hits doing something dumb. Right. You know, so they just don't take the risk anymore. God, it's so crazy that that's the incentive now that it's all clicks. Totally. It's, it's such a strange trap to fall into. And, and, and there's also the, the other thing, which is the, the litigation problem. You know, there, and, and this is another thing I wrote about in the book, is that there was a series of cases in the, in the 80s and 90s where reporters kind of took on big companies. I remember the Chiquita Banana thing that the Cincinnati Enquirer did. Uh, remember the movie The, um, the Insider? Mm -hmm. About Brian and Williamson, yes. the tobacco company, CBS, right? Um, there was another one with Monsanto in Florida where some Fox reporters went after Monsanto. and they So they all got sued, and it cost their companies a ton of money and reputational risk. And so after that, what news companies said is, why take on a big company that can fight back and throw a lawsuit at us? And what do we win by that? We're not going to get more audience from that, you know? So now if you watch consumer reporting, you know, at like a small um, TV station, usually it's they're going to bang on some little Chinese restaurant that has roaches or something like that. They're not going to go after Monsanto or, 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 you know, Chiquita Banana because there's no point. They're, 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 it, it's too much of a risk. So they just don't do it. And that's another thing that's that's gone wrong with reporting. You know, they they they've the economic benefit of going after a powerful adversary isn't there anymore. So they don't do it, and that's a, that's a problem. Now, clearly, you've seen a giant change in journalism from when you first started to where we are now. Do you have any fears or concerns about the future of it? I mean, this is what yeah. you do for a living. What is your what are your thoughts on it? Where do you think it's going? I mean, I'm really worried about it because um, because you, you need the journalists to kind of exist apart from politics and to be a check on everything. Right? I think that the whole idea of having a fourth estate is that it's separate from the political parties. Right? I mean, I don't work for the DNC. It's not my job to write bad news about Donald Trump. Right? That's the DNC's job. You know, they 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 put up press releases about them, and if people see us as in, as being indistinguishable from political parties or being all editorial, then we don't have any power anymore. Like that's that's the first thing. Like the press doesn't have an, any ability to influence people if people don't see us as independent and truthful and all those things, and so. That's what I really worry about right now is like people won't will stop listening to the media. They'll still tune us out. They don't trust us anymore. And like Walter Cronkite from, you know, 1972, the Gallup poll agency found that he was the most trusted man in America. And that was true also in 1985, like for 13 consecutive years, he was the most trusted. There's no reporter in America who's tr who's the trusted. most trusted man in America. Right? That doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it doesn't luck. exist. Yeah, exactly. So people think of us as clowns and, you know, entertainment figures. And so how are you going to how are you going to impact the world if people think you're a joke, you know, and, and that's why. That's what I really worry about. We don't have any institutional self-respect anymore. Yeah. You know, we don't. We don't feel like we have to, um, you know, ch challenge audiences, ch challenge powerful people. You know, it's it's just a bunch of talking points, and that's that's not what the business is about. So I, I, I worry about it, um, and you know, I think there are a lot of journalists who 
kind of say the same thing. We all kind of talk some, talk amongst ourselves, which is, you know, the, 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 the job as we knew it is kind of being phased out and changed into something else. And, um, and that's not, uh, that's not a good thing, you know, because people do need, in, in tough times, people need, need the press, uh, you know, as ridiculous as that sounds now, because, but it's true. And uh, I don't know where, where, where we go from here. Legitimate journalism is so important. It's right. so important. It's the only way you really find out what's going on. It's right. the only way. Right. You're not going to find out through the depictions of the people that were actually involved in it that want you to see it a certain way. You're not going to find that from people that have financial incentives and giving you a specific narrative. You need real journalism. Yeah. It's so hard to find. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're so lost. And it's one of the more insidious aspects of the term fake news. Because God damn, that's so easy to throw around. It's like it's so easy to call someone a bigot. It's so easy to call someone a racist. And it's so easy to say fake news. And all the, they all have the same sort of effect. They just diminish anything that you have to say almost instantaneously. Totally, and and the, the, there's when when you can cast the entire news as being fake, um, people can tune it tune it out. But a lot of that has to do with the, but who is doing the news reading now, right? Like in the '60s and '70s, and maybe before reporters, a lot of them came from the middle and lower classes. Like you know, they were it was the job was originally kind of like being a plumber, right? It, w it was more of a trade than a profession. And so you had a lot of people who who went into the job and they had this kind of attitude of just wanting to stick it to the man. You know, like they 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 didn't want to be close to power. They wanted to take it on. Mm. People like Seymour Hirsch, right? Like if you, you see that kind of personality who just wants to take the truth and rub it in somebody's face. Um, but then after all the president's men, it became this sexy thing to be a journalist. And you saw all, a lot of people from my generation who went into journalism because they wanted to be close to politicians and hang out with them. It's kind of like the primary colors thing, right? Where you mm. see people who, who they just want to like have a beer with the, with the presidential candidate. And that's totally different from what it used to be. Like now, so now, now we're on the wrong side of the rope line. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Like we're, like we used to, we used to be outside of power, like taking it on. And now we're kind of seeing we're, we're more upper class in, in, in the press and we're we're kind of in bed with the same people we were supposed to be covering and that's that's not a good thing people when people see that they 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 you know that's that's one of the reasons why they say they call us fake news is because they they see us as doing pr for you know rich people one of my favorite books ever about politics is fear and loathing on the campaign oh, trail yeah i wrote the introduction to that did oddly. you yeah the last the last, uh, last edition of that oh mm -hmm. That's, greatest book yeah it's a fantastic book and it's a great example of someone who knew that they weren't a part of that system so they could talk about it as an outsider he knew he was only going to be covering it for a year mm -hmm. so he just went in guns blazing got everybody fucked up drinking on the bus making everybody do burned acid. all of them <laughs> yeah yeah and he says that in the book he's like yeah. he's like look this isn't my beat yeah. i don't have any friends i have to keep you know, yeah. So I'm going to tell you everything that that I see, yeah. and fuck it, and and that's that's a real problem in reporting. When you when you you're in a beat for too long, you end up have developing unhealthy relationships with sources, mm. and you end up in a position where you're not going to burn the people who you're dependent on to get your information. And uh, when that happens to reporters, like I think that's one of the reasons it's good to to kind of cycle through different topics over the course of your career. Like if you if you get stuck in the same same beat too long eventually that you fall into that trap and thompson of course never did that like right. you, you know every story that he covered was you know he let it all hang out and just said whatever the hell he, he thought and you know he let the chips fall where they may and that's kind of the way i mean you can't do that all the time probably but i think that's the thing that was great it was amazing and there's no other examples of it <laughs> no no not and, like that yeah, yeah 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 i mean that book was so great on so on so many levels like he uh, I, mean, I always thought of it as being also kind of like a novel because it's a, it's this story about this person who's like obsessed with finding meaning and truth, but he he go, he goes to the most fake place on earth, which is the campaign trail, yeah. to look for it. And so all these depictions of all these terrible lying people, they're just so hilarious. And and uh, and so it's kind of you know it's almost like a Franz Kafka novel. It's yeah. it's amazing. And then it, it's great journalism at the same time. Like he's telling you how the system works and how how elections work, and it's really valuable for that. So yeah, that was brilliant. I mean, that's he also changed 
a lot. I mean, he actually affected politicians. Like the shit that he did with Ed Muskie. Where oh, my he, God. He, 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 <laughs> That was fantastic. When he was on the Dick Cavett show, and uh, Dick Cavett asked him about it, he goes, well, there's a rumor that uh, he was on Ibergain, and uh, I started that rumor. <laughs> I mean, it's just, he, uh, like, literally, that he got in that guy's head. And oh, yeah. And they, I remember the, he put that picture of Muskie, and he just found a picture of Muskie, and it's, I for, he's basically wearing... Like that. Yes. And the, the caption is Muskie in the throes of an Ibogaine frenzy, right? <laughs> and you couldn't get really get away with that now. Like he just, he just, you know, it was just. Well, it's a crazy drug to choose too because it's a drug that gets you off addictions. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. one of the more hilarious aspects of his choice. But it sounded great. Yeah. And with the oh, witch doctor yeah. and all oh, that stuff. Brazilian yeah. witch doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah, but you know that 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 kind of stuff probably wouldn't go over all that well right now. No, you know? he'd get sued. Yeah, but the, the, the that also he had this very very um, uh, sort of ag- aggressively uh, caricaturizing way of looking at politics and and politicians, and that that wouldn't go over that well now either. Like people don't want you to rip on the process as much as it, he did in that book. So it was great. It was just a fantastic book. Yeah, I mean, he had a, a bunch of them that were great, but that one particularly, it's you can sort of redo it. You could reread it every time we get to an election cycle, mm-hmm. and it sort of like goes, oh, you, it lets you know these are these are repeating cycles. This this is just like the the same shit that he was dealing with in you know various different forms, but you can see it all today. And, and it's funny, the reporters, everybody's read that book, everybody who covers can, campaigns, um, you know, I'm on my fifth right now for, for Rolling Stone, like I have, I have his old job, and uh, everybody has read that book, and so they they unconsciously try to make the same characters in each election cycle, so there's always like a Christ-like McGovern figure, mm. there's, there's a, a, you know, a, a turncoat quizzling spineless musky figure there's the end there's the the villain nixon you know trump trump kind of fills that role for a lot of reporters now um and then they all a lot of them try to behave in the same way that their characters um behaved in that book so you remember frank mankowitz was was uh mcgovern's sort of handler and he was having beers with with thompson after the events and kind of you know strategizing with them reporters try to do that they all try to do that with the candidates and their handlers. Now they try to develop those same relationships. It's just interesting. It's like they're reliv- mm. reliving the book, you know? That's yeah. a problem with someone that's really good, you know? They they, they, they take on so many imitators, mm-hmm. or so many imitators take on their demeanor and their thought process. Like, And Hunter was just such an iconic version of a writer that it's, it's so difficult, if you're a fan of his, to not want to be like that guy oh totally i mean i you know i i know that, i know that uh you know especially because I'm, I'm writing for the same magazine and covering a lot of the same topics you have to immediately realize that you can't do what he did like he, he thompson's writing was incredibly ambitious and, and unique he he was using a lot of the same te- te- techniques that the great fiction writers use like he was creating almost like this four-dimensional um, you know, story, but at the same time, it was also journalism. Like you, you can't really. Most people couldn't get away with that. You have to be a great, great writer. I mean, I'm talking like a rare Mark Twain level, yeah, uh, talent to really d- to do what he did, which is to kind of mix um, the you know the ambition of great fiction with with journalism. So if you try to do that stuff, it's going to be terrible. And I, I've done. I've certainly. If you look, go back and look at my writing, you'll find a lot of like shitty Thompson imitations, and uh, and so I, I learned to not do that pretty early. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's one of those don't try this at home things uh, for young writers. If you can, if you can avoid that, for sure. Do you have any? Do you have any hope? Is there anything that that you look to? You go, maybe this is going to be where this turns around. In terms of journalism, in terms of like, yes, I mean, I, I think, I mean, oddly enough, I think you, you know, show, shows like yours and, and the kind of prol- proliferation of like what you're talking about with with podcasts. The great thing about the internet, there are lots of bad things, uh, but the great thing about it is that it's given 
it's provided a way for people to just have an audience if they're good, right? If and, and if people have a demand for it, they're gonna they're, if there's a demand for it, you can exist. You you can have a platform and and so that's what I think is going to happen is that people are going to crack the code of what what kind of journalism people want and they're they're going to create something that people are going to flock to and I, I don't have a lot of faith that CBS, MSNBC, um, ABC, CNN that they're going to figure it out. Like I think it's going to be some independent kind of voice that is going to come up with something, a new formula, and people are that is going to rise up. You know, I mean, you, you've, you've seen it a little bit with uh, things like the Young Turks. You know, although they're you know they're cha- they've changed a little bit, but they figured out that if you provide something that's an alternative from the usual thing that you can you can succeed, you can get uh, a viable functioning business a lot faster than you used to be able to. What do you mean by they changed? Um, you know, I I I think you know they've they've kind of become a little bit more in the direction of a traditional news organization than they were originally maybe. I don't know. I I don't watch I don't watch it as much as I used to. So, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. But um but you know, again, the ability to do that is a lot different than it used to be. Like in, or, in order to have an independent journalism outlet, you used to have to, like, for instance, put out your own newspaper, which do do your own distribution, do your own printing, do your own design. All that stuff costs a ton of money. And it was very, very hard to do it without big corporate sponsors. Now, you know, now anybody with a good idea can can pretty much, you know, do something. And I have, so I have a lot of hope that somebody's going to figure it out. Um, it just... It's just we're not there yet. Yeah. I agree with you. I'm I'm optimistic. I have a lot of hope too, but I'm always like, "Fuck, let's hurry up already." Yeah, I know, I know. And you, it, and it's just until we get there, the the remnants of the old system of media, they're just you know, it's just so tough to watch. Flailing. Yeah, you know, they're they're flailing. They don't really know what to do. They're 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 kind of caught between just purely chasing the money and trying to adhere to what they thought the news look like in the past so it's like not entertaining you know if they were just chasing the money if they just come up organically today they would have had a different product entirely but they're trying to sound like legitimate news but they're also completely selling out at the same time and it's just not working you know yeah and so yeah we'll we'll, we'll see where we'll see where all that goes but it's it's <laughs> we're not here yeah, you're right they're flailing right now well matt taibbi i appreciate you man thanks a lot Joe. i really do great, it's great, great always, always an you. honor to talk to you no likewise um yep. your book tell people hate ink it's called, called hate ink uh it's by or books it's out it's out now you can buy it on amazon and my podcast is called useful idiots I'm with uh Kate, katie halper rollingstone.com so you can watch, check that out once a week Thank you. Thank All right, you very thanks, much. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate Bye, it. Bye, everybody. That was great. Awesome. Thank you.